I'm Matt Reynolds, and this is my podcast. I can do the job, but running the business is quite difficult. What a lot of tradesmen lack, and I was probably one of them, is business skills. I don't mind making mistakes. You learn from your mistakes. Information is all around you in the minds of people that work beside you. I'm Matt Reynolds, and this episode of Trench Talk is a collection of 30 snippets or highlights from the first 30 episodes of the show. As many of you know, or are about to hear, I've had a wide range of guests on Trench Talk thus far. I've done that purposefully to include people from the areas of business, sport, and entertainment, because I've found it beneficial, as you probably have, to routinely seek the opinions and wisdom from those who operate outside of my own field. The advantage being that with different framework, outsiders often view circumstances differently and therefore have perspectives that we don't or can't see for ourselves. And here it's all from the super practical and hands-on angle of me, a plumber by trade. You can get access to all episodes of Trench Talk in full from pretty much any podcast player, including iTunes and Spotify, or at trenchtalkpodcast.com, where you'll also find all the show notes. Enjoy 30 highlights from the first 30 shows. First up are three clips from episode one with Gold Logie winner Scotty Cam. His thoughts on money, book recommendations, and his advice on taking advice. Do you have any specific money advice for business owners? I mean, we all need more training, clearly, but is there anything that you can say, if you're going to do anything, just make sure you do this one thing? Well, if you're going to do anything, is buy, buy your own house. That's what I say. The easiest way to make a hundred grand a year or fifty grand a year, depending on where you're buying a house, is to buy a house. And uh, and as a tradesman, you can do that up, rent it out. You don't have to live in it. You live at home with mum and dad. But buy a house, do it. Use your skills to improve on that house. Hang on to it, rent it out, and then sell it. If you're in a reasonable area, uh, you don't have to buy a mansion. You can just buy a two bedroom unit or something. You'll make twenty grand a year for doing, you know, not much. And the that's research I did... I mean, no, the thing is, in our game, tradesmen, that's our superannuation, is, is trying to have some property. You know, you, you, have, you buy some property and try not to sell it. You do it up, rent it out, and buy again. And, you know, and that, that's what I think a tradesman's superannuation is, is, is bricks and mortar. Because you can maintain it yourself. You can look after it. The people will, will disagree with me and say, that, you know, the percentage returns are only 3 or 4%. But at the end of the day... Do tradesmen know a lot about shares? I don't think so. Do, do they know about investments in other things? I don't think so. I think property is what tradesmen know. Because it's not all about what you make, is it? There's also the other aspect of what you need to put into it. And if you're not paying for the trade, then automatically your returns go through the roof compared to, you know, the general figures quoted or whatever because you just don't have the same cost. Yeah, that's right. And I think that, you know, like plumbers, electricians, uh, people like that, they're all pretty handy. They've been on a building site their whole life and so therefore they can have a crack at a little bit of chip rocking and and obviously they do the electrical and they get a plumber in and vice versa and a carpenter he can do you know the plumber the plastering and all that sort of thing but he gets a plumber and electrician in but you know there's lots of things you can do within the house obviously you paint the whole joint yourself and you know you certainly that that's that's your super that, that's where you, you've got to end up when you're when you're 50 with a couple of, with a couple of joints have you got any favorite books or documentaries you can recommend favorite book uh, um well, uh, my favourite book of all time is A Fortunate Life by Albert Facey. Have you ever read that? No, I haven't, but I'll put I've it on my list. I've bought it for maybe 30 people in my life. Wow. And so I read this. Um, it's what? written by a man uh, called Bertie Facey, or well, Albert, but they used to call him Bertie when he was a kid. Uh, he's, he had this incredible life, uh, and his daughter, when he was about 83, said, you should write this down. You should write your life down, write a story, write the book. And uh, so he wrote it, and he, he actually died just as it was published. And uh, he was, lived in Fremantle in Perth, and uh, he's had a terrible life up until, you know, the time he was married, I suppose. And it, it's the book's called A Fortunate Life by Albert Facey, and it's, it's his life story from the age of six years old where he had to go to work, and it's an Aussie story, and it's all Australian, and you'll recognise all the places. It's a fantastic read. Um, my, you know, the people I've given it to, I've got about four copies here now, in case someone walks in and, and haven't read it, so I said, take it, take that. <laughs> that's a, that's, yeah, that's so awesome. That, that was a great influence on me. I, I really, uh, you know, when you have, think you go, well, shit, that I'm having a bad day or something like that, you think about, you know, yeah, I've got a very fortunate life. What's the worst advice you hear dished out for tradesmen? Well, I have a theory about uh, advice. 
and that is advice only suits the person giving it. That's been my my lifelong um, motto. So I'm not a, I'm not an advice person. I don't receive advice. I don't really give that much advice unless I'm asked. But you know, I'll certainly give advice to my apprentices and about how to work and things like that. But advice only ever suits the person that's giving it to you. It it, it might not be anywhere near what you, is good for you. You've got to make up your own decisions about how you work and how you and, and your lifestyle and things like that. Um, you can obviously be steered in some directions, but uh, I think uh, that's something that I've lived by that has worked for me pretty well. Episode two featured Justin Burgoyne. Here's a snippet, including where his company King Chrome is investing, his thoughts on innovation, and how he recruits. And you mentioned you want to make, or you, you already do, but you want to make a more significant investment in design. Yep. What does that look like in the next 12 to 24 months for you guys? So we've, we, well, we not estimate, we have spent this last, fin- this financial year, just gone, we'll just spend over 800,000 US. Yep. And we want to grow that 20% a year and just compound it every year. Further investment Further into, into design. Into our own design and tooling. Yep. And is that big... Uh, because you can sell that because the market needs it? Like, oh, We just see it as it controls our own destiny. We feel that with our own, if we have things that are unique and and, and everyone, wants, everyone sees, and I think it's the old, you know, that's the same hammer or this is the same pair of cutters or it's things that are unique. And you see the next generation of tradespeople coming through. I think they're smarter than they've ever been. I think they're more educated than they've ever been. And, you know, with mobile phone applications and the world opening up to technologies, you know, you can learn about things on YouTube and how to, how to fix things so much faster. So I, I can see us, we've got to be a little bit more innovative. We've got to bring innovation into the programs and products we do going forward. I just think we can't just rest on our laurels and just have the same thing over and over and over and over and over. I just think it's going to sell forever. So will technology come into tooling? I mean, we've seen it a little bit, mm-hmm. and we've certainly seen it on the admin side of our businesses, yeah, as everybody yep. else has. Can technology change the way a spanner is used? I'm not sure. Will it, do we have to worry about yeah. robots stealing our jobs just yeah. yet? Like, where, where are we heading? Because Yeah, I, look, I, I, I think there will be, but I still think at the old... Look, the, we still build buildings similar to what we have probably the last couple hundred years. Is, look, materials have got better. I think uh, we're getting better at putting them faster and more efficient and, you know, and probably um, better at building things. But when you're down a tr- six-foot uh, foot trench and it's, you know, there's <laughs> mud and shit everywhere yeah. and you drop your level or you drop your hammer, you know, if you drop your mobile phone and it, it's cactus. Yeah. So, you know, there's got to, you know, measuring things and there's still going to be that old school, it's got to be ruggedness or toughness, I call it. Yeah. Got to, you know, I think tools, you know, and we that's what we see. It's got to be, it's got to look good, it's got to be efficient, but it's also got to be tough. And that comes back to the quality and quality. I'm sensing this, the, the toughness, the quality, this kind of can-do attitude yeah. is a, is that built, I mean, is that a good description of your overall culture yeah. of, the, of the company? Yeah, absolutely. And how do you recruit to ensure that culture is uh, maintained and grows? I mean, I know it's a buzzword yeah. and we hear so much about it, but uh, I'm interested in your thoughts on maintaining well, that uh, direction. Well, look, this business has, has been successful, not just because of myself and my father, far from it. It's been successful from the great people we have around us. And everyone says that. That's a cliche. But, you know, our first employee that we've got when from February 1987, February 1988, Mark Minarelli is the head of our um, marketing team. Okay. And he's been a good mate of mine. We've worked together in this business for, well, th- I'm 30 years, he's 29 years. Yeah. And, you know, we Call, and we call ourselves blue bloods. This is part of our values is to be a blue blood. Oh, I did read that. Yeah. yeah. So not as if you want to be royalty, uh, but it's, you know, that you bleed blue for the company, that you really, you know, you understand what the, what being a king chrome person is all about and you know, be a team player. Um, so, you know, our people, we've got great people, really. And, we're, you know, we've really, really got some fantastic people. And when you're looking for someone to fill a new position or that you know that comes about how do you how do you ensure that 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 continues to happen 
I think we, yeah, look, for, for us, we, we call it, you know, being a blue blood, but it's also, you've got to do an apprenticeship. You've got to, it's not as if you come in and, and have the right attitude. So it's got to be a bit of an apprenticeship that we, it's not an apprenticeship as per se, it's not, there's a time and this is what you're going to do and this is what you've got to get to, but we invest a lot in training our people. We invest a lot in, in the induction of people and we set very set, expectations from what we want from our people and it's the enthusiasm it's how people get involved it's how people ask questions that's the big thing for us if they're asking questions and not you know uh, doing as little as possible we see that they you know come through and we always we always go through a six-month review for the fir our first for employees for the first two years so we have a four stage review process and we sit down with them and go through how they're feeling and how we are and be absolutely straight with them on how that you know what our expectations are okay. not easy not e not easy discussions but it's best to have those up front and be straight with people and you're not afraid to tackle those things head on, I would no. assume. Well, it's like how I'd like to be treated. Yeah. You know, telling me as it is. If I'm not doing the right thing, well, what can I do to improve? Yeah. Do you generally promote from within, or do you, does your history suggest that you, you sort of bring people up if you invest in training? Yeah. Or do you go outside when you when you need to? Is it a... Interesting. Yeah, good question. <laughs> really good. We've just gone through a bit of a cycle. As the business last 30 years, we've, we've promoted heavily from within, um, and up until probably 18 months ago, we sort of went outside a little bit. We thought we needed to bring some outside people into the business, um, which had, we've had some great success. We've had some real good winners and people come on board, but we've had we haven't had to, sometimes we've had some losers, some not losers. What's the word I'm looking for? Haven't been successful. As okay. successful as we wanted it to be. Do you have a nat natural uh, tendency to go one way though? Or? Yeah, we do. I, I love promoting from within. I okay. love seeing people come, and we've got a lot of you know our head of merchandise, Chris Collins or Tank, we call him. Yeah. Um, he's, he's a good man. He's come from down. He's come from the where. Come from assembling toolkits. When he started with us, he had dreadlocks down past his ass or bottom, I should say. <laughs> so he he's he you know and had more holes in his ears and his tongue and his lips and everything like that. And he's awesome, smart man that's done a fantastic job for us. And I, we've got dozens of those stories, dozens of stories like that. Actor Shane Jacobson joined me for number three. Here's some of his thoughts on being productive and getting things done. And look, the reality is you kind of have to get things done in order to move on to the next thing. And interesting, when you get, you know, I think if you are a really busy person, and a lot of people out there are, when you get down to only one or two things left to do, you can drag your heels getting those done. But when you've got 50 to do, you start to plough through them. So I think you know, even a busy person, if you only listen with two things to do, they'd probably drag their feet and catch up with a friend and go out for a drink or, you know, ring, ring a mate and have a casual chat. <clears throat> and uh, But like I said, when there's a list of 50 things to get done, you can't help but know you've just got to start to plough through them. So is that an environment that you purposely create for yourself to take on more than you can get done just to force a higher than expected output? No, not at all. You know, I'd be happy for things to be quieter. And I know people do say... Um, you can just say no. And I do say no a lot, is the truth. There's a lot of stuff that we say no to. Um, because, you know, it's a wonderful thing. People kind of send you ideas and go, I've got this idea and I've got that idea. But, of course, the truth is I, I and people close to me have so many great ideas already in their pipeline that we're not looking for new ideas. We're actually just trying to execute the ones we've got. Um, and you can't help but want to complete your own projects, if that makes sense. Um, that's not to say, I mean, you know, if, if a film comes in that, uh, that's been written and it's got a budget that's ready to go, of course you'll do that. But um, I don't do it on purpose. It, it, it's just the problem is you look at an idea or you see a potential in something or you're talking to someone casually and they're going, that would be a great idea. And you start to have a chat about how you would execute it. Before you know it, the thing starts to grow its own legs. And so, yeah, I, I, don't, think it, I don't think it's that I create, uh, that I intentionally create a busy world for myself. But 
in the business of creating things, you just tend to be busy. But yeah, you know, I know it's a horse and cart thing, you know. Is it, is it, but I certainly don't do it to go. God, I need more projects to work on. I, you know. But when a good idea comes up, or a great script, or or you've been worked some projects, the other thing is they take a really long while. Um, it's not like it's, it's, you know, I've, I've, in the last couple of weeks, I have built a dog house and you know, built a new chook shed. Those things you can kind of go, I'm going to do that. Go out there, you know, I'll, you know, grab a grab me nail, you know, nail gun and go bang, 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 shoot the thing together and it's built. You can get that over and done within a couple of days. Obviously, it's a different if you're building a house. But little projects like that you can knock over quickly. But things like films and TV shows, they take a very long while. So, um, you know, a movie, on average, a film from when someone goes, I've got a good idea to a film, to a film, to it being in a cinema, is, would, would, on average, never be less than seven years. Seven years? Wow. That's yep. a lot longer than I would have expected. Yeah. Someone says to me now, I've got this great idea for a movie you should look at. From that point, if, if they're part of a team that's really got themselves together, On average, it'll be seven years until that movie comes out, and I don't think people realise that. Here are two snippets from episode four with Ross Savas of Kay and Burton on protecting your brand, work ethic, and the importance of sleep. How do you go about protecting that brand? Because one of the good things about doing these type of interviews is that we've known each other for quite a while, but you go looking for information and, and, and find out stuff that you wouldn't otherwise yeah. have known. Um, I found an article yesterday which said that you actually had one of your co-workers sell his Ferrari because it didn't fit in with your brand. True, true. It's, um, it's true, and he's a great friend of mine, and um, he's, a, he's a great fella. And uh, I, I thought that in actual fact that... You know, he, he loves cars and, and I, I, I said to him, there's no, no problem about loving cars, but you can't drive this car as an everyday car. And um, it was a really nice conversation because we've been friends for such a long time. And he said, you know what, you know, I've driven for a little while now. It's, I, I, I've enjoyed it, but I didn't enjoy it that much. And um, he sold it and really he saw the point that I think you've got to be very careful um, in the image you portray, no matter how successful you are in Melbourne, because we're, we're basically very conservative uh, here in Melbourne, and I think you've the best place uh, to be is to, if he wants to invest that sort of money, I, I, I told him to buy some more real estate, <laughs> and, he, and he laughed, and he said, you're absolutely right, and um, he has done that, by the way. and. He said to me that um, he went through a little phase where, you know, he wanted to have a toy and I think you can have a toy and drive it on a Sunday and I think there's anything wrong with that. But to drive it as um, an everyday car, maybe you can do that in, in, in cities like perhaps LA or other places in the world, but I don't think it's as accessible, you know, really the thing to do um, in our very conservative city of Melbourne. So when you pull up to a client's house in that car, why is that a bad thing for your brand? I think it's really for us, uh, we're not flash. Um, we're considered. Uh, I suppose we're very considered people. And you can you can be flash. And I think uh, I drive a, a Range Rover and, you know, it's just a, for me, that's a really safe car. It's a big car. And the, the way I think about it is if it's, if, if it's great for the Queen and, and uh, the royal family, it's got to be really good for me. So uh, I'd rather think of it that way. And, um, you know, and I, I think that yeah, there's nothing wrong with having a love for, for cars, but when you're in a professional services business, I think it's, you know, there is a, a point where you just have to be, you know, more conservative. That's all. Okay. So you want, let's, but going back to the brand, that is you want to be at the highest level without the show. Without the flash. And I also, I, I found another thing online which I wanted to ask you about. Sure. Ask I'm really fascinated with the work ethic of high-performing people. Mm-hmm. And I understand that you, very early in your career, trained yourself out of sleep so you could spend more time working. Yeah. You're nodding, so that's true. It is true. How did you do it? Wow. It's a really deep question. So I, I worked out that if you slept less you can deal with the overseas market a lot more because it's different times and um, we're in different time zones 
So I, I figured that if I could get three hours sleep, for example, a night, I can, you know, do a lot more work and um, I could uh, keep building what I call a global relationship database. And really that really is talking to people in their time zone and, and, and you know, really having much more meaningful and, and deep conversations, which sometimes can take, you know, 30 minutes and sometimes can take an hour. And um, so I, I absolutely, uh, over, I suppose, a, a two or three year journey, and I, I trained myself really to, you know, stay up and live on less sleep. Unfortunately for me, it had some quite uh, interesting health ramifications. I, I, uh, I did find a couple of those as well. <laughs> so uh, I actually got a, became, um, I got a fast heartbeat and um, okay. they couldn't find out what, what caused it. And, you know, I went to, you know, some amazing specialists here. And then they, we did a sleep test. And um, after the sleep test at Epworth Hospital, the professor said, you need to come to my office immediately. And I said, well, I thought, you know, we have a consultation afterwards. And the nurse said, you're going directly to the professor's office. And um, he said to me... Uh, like, it sounds like going to the principal's office. Well, it was a pretty interesting conversation. And I walked in and he said, you, sh you really shouldn't be here. And I said, oh, does that mean... I knew exactly what he meant, but I yeah. said, well, you want me to come back another day? He said, sit down. And he gave me... You know, he read me the right act. And he said, y you know, you're sleeping two to three hours a night. I said, I, I can see. We can see. You can't fudge this. We see the activity. And I said, yeah, I've trained myself. He said, well... Let me tell you, if you don't retrain yourself, <laughs> you won't be here for much longer. And he said, your body can't keep up, you know, with your mind. And it's not, it's not healthy. And quite frankly, I retrained myself now. I slept six hours a night and I haven't had that problem. And uh, I'm very happy that I haven't had that problem because it was quite unnerving um, to get, you know, such a, a rapid and fast heartbeat uh, while I could have been sitting here talking to you and suddenly my, my heartbeat would, would race. And uh, that was just my body saying to me, it's not coping with so is that, sleep. Is that early, like, arrhythmia or something like that? Is that? Yeah. Uh, tachycardia. But, um, right, yeah. Uh, it was like uh, sitting here and someone putting the, uh, their foot down on the, uh, on, the, on the accelerator and your heart would... Well, you could feel that. Absolutely, you could feel it. It was, <laughs> it was incredible. It was seriously incredibly scary. And how long did that go on before you had the, had the sleep test? I had six episodes in one year right. and, and they were six very scary episodes and I would never have thought it was that. I, yep. I actually never. And, you know, I spent a week in the Epworth Hospital and they, they, they checked everything out and they said, well, we, we can't find anything. But I had six separate episodes and one actually emergency expert uh, specialist at Epworth said, I think... It could be you're just a workaholic and you need to have a more of a balance. And I said to her, no, it can't be that. <laughs> it's impossible. No. I'm, I'm only I working 21 or 22 hours a day. What are you what talking I, about? I love what I do. It's like a, every day's a holiday. And, um, and she was looking at me saying, I'm not getting through to you. You need to slow down, you know. And I, I say, but I, don't, I, I feel great. I really, and I did. I, felt, I actually felt... Great. Except for those episodes, you yep. felt good. I felt great. Okay. I really felt great. And, yep. um, and it, it's different, you know, being at home, being on the phone and talking to people internationally rather than being in your office in your suit and tie. And, you know, it's quite relaxing, you know, yep. and um, you're in a nice environment and you're, you're talking to people you know and trying to help them move from, you know, London or New York or Singapore or Hong Kong into Australia. And it's a really nice thing. And, you, you know, you're assisting their kids getting into schools and you're organising short-term accommodation till they buy their house. And it, it's really a, a, a beautiful thing. Yeah. So for me, I, I was loving it. But I didn't realise the ramifications of the lack of sleep. And quite frankly, if you look at all the studies since, sleep is imperative and uh, we need it. It's, this is another really common pattern that I'm seeing is that people find themselves like you did, something you really love doing, you take it to the extreme and then you re-evaluate and bring it back in terms of sleep to about that six hours. And that seems to be about where a lot of um, really top level people seem to settle at. So it's, a, it's an interesting pattern, but it always comes up in these conversations. Big wave surfer and Britain's most famous plumber, Andrew Cotton, joined me from Portugal 
for episode five. Here's a grab from our chat. Andrew talks through a conversation he had with his wife and the importance of having family support. It's an interesting question because um, what, what I often find is that people who you know go on to create at some level of, of success like you have seem to have this way of navigating the kind of put food on your table versus following their dreams equation. And um, there's this... Uh, I, I guess an underlying um, ability to back yourself and what you want to do over what maybe seems logically uh, the best thing to do from, for instance, a financial uh, perspective at the time. Yeah, yeah. And, and you, you're 100% right. And I had like this weird conversation with my wife, like, and um, I'd like, I was uh, like part time plumbing and lifeguarding a bit. And then I was, had a bit of sponsorship with my surfing and, um, so, like, I'd chase swells in the winter and then do odd jobs like plumbing and stuff and getting the cash in. And, and I lost my sponsorship. And and I was, like, I had this weird conversation with my wife in the in the kitchen. It was, like, one of those sort of, like, life moments. And um, and I was expecting her to go, like, okay, right, well, you just got to go the, and get a full-time plumbing job. And, like, because, you know, we had two small kids, like, you know. And she just said, well, what do you really want to do? And I was, like, well... I just want to surf like the biggest waves in the world. And she's like, well, go and do that then. Like, like you just got to make it happen. And it was like a really weird, like having, having someone like so close who, cause sometimes the people that are closest to you are like, you know, they don't want to put you off like dreams, but they also probably worry the most that the dreams won't work out. And then, then where are we going to be? You know, I think, yeah. I don't know. But, but um, so, but you just like make it happen, you know, like you've got to make it happen. And it was just motivation to like sort of, you know, to get, get into it and, you know, um, and put everything into it and have like, you know, having that support where, you, you know, like I was chasing waves, hoping something will happen, um, you know, is, is, you know, that's amazing. You know, like, and, and, and luckily it did happen, but, you know, it did work out because it might not have, <laughs> you know, it could have. Yeah, but then, then yeah, you've always got your, yeah, nine to five. Like my dad said, like, when you're married, you, you got a job for life. So, well, <laughs> so, yeah, you, you, yeah, the, the plan B is always there. It's never going to go away. So that's um, yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's an awesome way of looking at it. Trav Bell is the bucket list guy. Here's a few minutes from episode six on creating your own bucket list. So I was having a conversation with my wife last night about this interview, and it ended up going for an hour or so actually it's quite 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 interesting um about this concept of a bucket list which we absolutely love um the the point we came to how do you how do you reconcile your bucket list with what's truly important to you because we we don't know but we assumed that a bucket list can very quickly default to some cliche items Mm. so how do you ensure that what's on your bucket list is right for you? Easy. I just asked you 12 questions. Yeah. Um, and those questions should help you extract and then articulate a personally meaningful and holistic bucket list. And those 12 questions, is that your My Bucket List yeah. acronym? So if I ask you, and it can be a rhetorical question, you don't have to give me answers, but... Yep. You know, and, and the people listening as well, um, I can get them a TED talk and have a look at this. And but yeah, it's in my bucket list blueprint. So it basically is a an acronym. So M. So it says my bucket list. M stands for the people. You know, meet a personal hero. Yep. So who do you want to meet before your time is up? Just go. Give me an answer. Um, Richard Branson. There you go. All right, cool. Probably a popular yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and, and, and like that, and so this is not a, it's also not a pissing contest, you know, let's remove ego and, and go, well, someone else, like, you know, my girlfriend doesn't want to meet, meet Richard Branson. You know, like that, yep. that's totally cool. And, and so when I'm in rooms, I say, look, you're allowed to cheat, copy and steal from other people, but there's yep. also to be no judgment, like, like, who cares? You know, like people want to meet random people. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what? That's that's your life. You know, like it's not compa- – we live in such a, uh, a comparative world. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter. And 
Um, and they can be big ones and they can be small ones. Do you suggest keeping your list private? Why? Or, or do no, you make it public? You don't. No, I don't. So you make your list public? Uh, or certain public aspects of it? Yeah, it's about to get really public um, uh, in terms of uh, putting it out there. But every time I speak, I... I you talk about yeah, it? Yeah, talk about it. Okay. <laughs> so who's, who's, who's your hero at the moment? Who's, who's number one? Well, I've, I've met, you know, Tim Ferriss. Yep. I had lunch with the boy uh, yep. and he was a really cool guy and, and uh, but I still want to meet Cadell. I still haven't met Cadell Evans. Oh, wow. And he lives around the corner from me. He uh, does too, uh, you're right. Slater, Elon Musk, I saw you got him up there. Yeah. Um, and and uh, who else is on there? Jared Leto. Who is? The lead singer of 30 Seconds to Mars. Oh, there you go. I'm not a music person. There you know go. That. You know, yeah. look, who cares? But yeah. he's a really cool. I'll follow him on you know, Instagram and this sort of thing. Gianlucia Vacchi as well. Okay. Don't know who he is? No, I don't. Doesn't matter. <laughs> See, the point The point being, um, I do. Yeah. And I. And why? Because they're such a role model. It, the role model in the things that they do. Yes. And, and they have, I really love how they work their life and, they, you know, um, their traits, behaviours and this sort of thing. So, um, yeah, there's a bunch of people on my list that uh, mean nothing to anyone else and that's totally cool. So we've got M. What's Y? Y stands for your proud achievements. They're all the things that you want to be really proud of before your time is up. We covered a lot in Episode 7. Here's yogi and healer Ben Sorfawara on breathing correctly. It's just that more people know about it or is there a factor that we need the practice of it more now as a, uh, as a world, as a me, society? For me personally, I live by it. So if you ask me, I would definitely say yes. It is very important for, the, for our health physically because there are certain things in yoga, if you know, first of all, most people do not know how to breathe. Go figure. I'll say it again. Most people do not know how to breathe. Can you? You'll be amazed how many times people come to sessions and you tell them to breathe and they breathe the other way. It's like a balloon. You put air comes into a balloon or anything for that matter that's got space in it, it has to expand. A lot of people don't breathe, their stomach doesn't expand. So what most people have shallow breathing only to the chest. And now when they get stressed, it goes into their throat and then anxiety sits in or any other things that can set in from there. When you teach them how to breathe, they actually surprise, and they would always say to you, a lot of them will say to you anyway, oh my God, I've been breathing the wrong way. And they laugh. Because when we are raised as, as babies, our parents are mostly concerned about our first words or our first steps that we're gonna take in life. Yeah, Mommy, age. daddy is what we focus on. We don't even teach a child how to breathe. So that you're left to your own devices to figure that out yourself. Go figure, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. There's a lot of things like that, isn't there? Absolutely. That, that's, uh, that's right. You look it's, back and you're like, hmm, that was probably a pretty important thing you, to get right. Exactly. And I will say this to you now. You can be without food and water for two weeks, sometimes even more. And every time I've said this every now and again in a session, people will look at me like, are you crazy? There's no way. If I don't eat for two days, I'll be dead. It's been proven many times. There's been times every time again there's a natural disaster. Any part of the world, go look it up. They start saying they dig in and looking for survivors. Three days later, four days later, a week later, 10 days later, 12, 13 days later, they find people. Two weeks later, they find people. Sometimes people are marooned on the, on the ocean somewhere and they survive without food and water. Exactly. But they're all the great. body, the, or the, what you call the body or your body, the machine that's referred to as a body is an incredible machine. But they've all been breathing for those 12 or 13 days, right? Absolutely. <laughs> because once you go into a state of shock or anything that you want, you experience at the time, or once you get past a certain level of, you know, starvation, things like the body then switches into an autopilot of its own to then begin to do what it's really designed to do to last longer for you. So do you have any quick tips, things you can do to, in to ensure you breathe better? What I usually say to people with breathing, because it's the most important thing, without Breathing within minutes, you cease to exist, literally. Again, like I said before, without food and water, you can exist for a longer time. I mean, you know, it all depends. With breathing, the first thing you need to always remember is the most important time for you to especially breathe deeply is when you're stressed. Because naturally, your muscles tense up and everything and begin. And we all say this naturally anyway, when you go through a traumatic situation, God forbid, and it's an accident, they put your sides there, go, breathe, breathe, just calm down and breathe. We all say it naturally. Okay, so to breathe, keep your spine straight, 
if you're seated, standing, whatever the case might be, even if you're laying down, just straighten yourself up. Inhale deeply through your nose and feel your abdominal region expand or diaphragm expanding outward, upward, depending on how you are uh, situated, lying or seated. And you make it very smooth and gentle. Inhale, 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 and feel your stomach expanding, expanding, and that's it. The breath comes in. To go even deeper than that, as you breathe in, you focus on the energy coming through with the breath that you breathe into your body. That literally awakens your cells because you have intent to come in with the breath. Do you have any thoughts on the time it takes? You know, you, you, I'm not sure the exact terminology, but you hear like two, two breathing and all this sort of stuff. Like, is it just a natural flow in and out for you or should it be quicker in or that? How does okay, it, how does it well, see, this is, you're now going to another area of the breathing now. There are different styles and techniques of breathing. Okay. And they have different things that give as effects on the body and on the mind. Uh, there are different ways for you to breathe to diff- that we use in yoga to help, you know, elicit different effects on the body or on the mind, like I mentioned. So there's the complete breath, which is just regular deep breathing, diaphragmatic breath, deep breathing. There are other styles of breathing, like the breath of fire that you use to really, you know, awaken the cells and bring warmth in the body and bring clarity and also just get charged up. Uh, there's the bee breath or the humming breath, for example, and there are other styles of breathing. There's the four and eight breath count as well, which is more or less probably what you're referring to with the counting of the breaths. Yep. And there's different counts as well to also strengthen the lung, to build your lung capacity, to help, to help for example, swimmers to be able to hold their breath longer. There are also different that you can utilize as well, where you actually retain the breathing or hold your breath and then breathe again and hold again, or breathe again, and so on and so forth. So sticking with our de-stressing example that you gave before, full breath, slow, mm-hmm. and just calm yourself down. That's the one that anyone and everybody can do, including kids, because teaching the kids these days in school or any other places where you're going to be taught to kids from age five and up and able to easily, you know, grasp it. The idea is just to relax and inhale and feel your stomach, you know, expanded. Sometimes you may place one hand on your abdominal region and one hand over around your chest region and you feel your stomach expand and expand. Or you can sometimes place both hands around your abdominal region to feel it expanding outward and dropping back downward as you exhale, exhale, contracting. And the key thing with that in terms of stress is when you are exhaling. That's that's the one thing a lot of students in yoga don't even pay attention to because they've only focused on the postures. Anytime you're in a yoga pose or you're practicing yoga or any other thing for that matter and you're already carrying stress, as you exhale, even if you're doing just regular exercise, the quicker you focus on something, that you're trying to attain, in other words, your intent comes with it, the quicker you're going to attain it. In other words, I'm stressed. I want to go for a jog. When I'm jogging, I will focus on happiness as I'm jogging. Why? That's what my intention is. Or as you breathe, jogging, jog as you breathe in, exhaling every time, or every few moments as you're exhaling, as you're jogging, that you're letting go of all the stresses out of your mind. You will clear it and reduce it quicker than just go for a jog and come back because you've not focused on what you're trying to attain with what your, the activity which you just did. And the breathing leads directly to your intent, right? Breathing the intent and then connects to your mind and your subconscious. So what? The breathing is not just breathing, don't forget. Episode 8, here's former AFL superstar Anthony Kudafetis on playing big games, sacrifices, outrunning fans during grand final week, tips on high performance and goal setting. The other game I wanted to ask you about was round 5, 1996. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yes. West Coast. Yes. I've still got the game on tape. Have you? <laughs> One of the ones that I go back to regularly because talk about read the ball. Yeah. And I mean, maybe there is another example. That's my favourite example of someone yourself who continually read read the ball over and over again. He's in the right place in the right time. Like, did you feel it on that day too? Yeah, I did. The first quarter, I think I had six. I was just plucking them, you know, out of everywhere. And I thought, okay, this is the way to start. A bit of confidence, you know. So, yeah, d- definitely that day and, you know, getting the ball off the ground and kicking left foot and, you know, everything, it did go my way and re- it went right down the crunch to the end, you know, and I was lucky I marked that ball at the end also. But sometimes I feel like as people, you know, compare to certain current day players and go, you know, whatever, but I had to sacrifice a lot of my years and, and time in the probably positions of the footy field that maybe I, you know, didn't play as good as what I should have. But... I wonder what I could have produced if I was playing solely in the midfield, not on the wing, because I was on the wing that day to, you know, to mark the ball 18 times. So who knows what I could have 
the competition if I went straight into midfield, but because I was versatile, you had to sort of sacrifice a little bit for the team. But And you had a bit of day. competition in the midfield too yeah, in terms of the other players absolutely. that were there through that era too. Absolute right? guns, yeah. And I guess those players probably couldn't play on the wing or half forward or full full back or full forward and, you know, centre forward like I could. So True, yeah. they were a little bit limited. So I had to sacrifice a little bit of my game until later on in my career. But that definitely that West Coast game there was... The thing I remember most, obviously I read the ball and took some really good contested marks, so it's not like nowadays, you know what I mean? There would have been a lot of contested marks, but the crowd after the game, that was the, I think that was the day, you know, where they were all chanting out, kudo, kudo, I'm thinking, is that for me? Like, what's going on here? And I remember yeah. getting an interview going, oh, but Greg Williams was so good today, he's a superstar, and whoever was interviewing me said, don't worry about Greg today, it's about you, <laughs> kudo, and I went, oh, okay. <laughs> And the whole crowd was chanting, kudo, kudo. And I always drove mum and dad to the game, so they waited for me afterwards. And there was just hundreds of people waiting outside, and they just followed me the entire way, all the way to the car. And I don't know how many autographs I signed, but I got inundated. So, I mean, I was, I guess, pretty popular in 95 after we won the premiership, and yep. 96 after that game, oh, there was just people everywhere. And that's the period where you had to, I think I read, sneak in and out of the training ground and those sort of things. That was 95... Right. That was 95 in the grand final week. Yeah. yeah. So it used to take us an hour to walk in, you know, with all, all the supporters. I'm not sure what it's like for the guys nowadays. Maybe footy was a bigger, like, bigger thing back then. I'm not sure. But it would take us an hour to walk in. Then you're tired after training. You want to get home and eat. And yeah. I didn't live locally. I lived down in Thomastown. It was a 30, 35 minute drive. And then you're outside, you know, signing for another hour. It was really hard. So Ange and I, in particular, and I remember the Thursday night, we went to training about. Uh, Two hours maybe before, an hour and a half, but we parked at the back of the oval, yeah. snuck in through the back, and after training, we, we looked up upstairs and we could see all these supporters and then we're like, oh, we're going that way right over there. And so we snuck out down the back because, you know, it's a tough week, it's a hard week, and, uh, you know, a lot of people around following us and you want to just be able to just concentrate on the grand final and not get distractions from other people. How hard is that during that week to maintain that focus? Because... You're in, in that period of the, the sort of the second half of the 90s, right, you were not only in a high-performing environment in terms of AFL football club at Carlton, but you're also in a high-achieving environment in from a club sense because you were winning and also that was the period that you really lifted your game to a level that was now considered one of the best careers that has ever been in the AFL, right? So if someone is... Um, wanting to move from mediocre, from what their performance is now, be it business in sport or whatever, to a high-performing person and to do it with the distractions that you had, is there any advice, tips you've got on that scenario? It's a tough one. I had to really get used to it and uh, being recognised and, you know, people coming over to my house and our phone at home. We had Kuda Fetis in the white pages. Can you imagine? It was the only one. So, <laughs> yeah, grand imagine. final week, the phone was off the hook because as soon as we put it back on, it was just ringing like crazy and people following me. And so I had a lot of distractions because, you know, then your sponsorship comes and you're doing commercials and things like that and you really can get distracted. But at the end of the day, you've got to be, I think, a level head, not let things get to you and believe you're better than anyone else. As soon as, you, as soon as anyone believes they're better than just say, you know, if you've mastered the game of football, it will chew you up, you know. And so you have to just keep working hard and focus and be disciplined. All those things that we, you know, that I spoke about before, the commitment that you do and still have your goals that you want to achieve, you know. There's no backing off no matter what and don't ever miss training because you're tired or whatever. you just got to, you know, turn up. And so you've got to understand your body as well, your body and mind. Goals comes up often in these conversations that I have. You had uh, Carlton psychologist, yeah. excuse me, I was about to say yeah. psychiatrist, Andrew Stewart advised you to write down every day yeah. and highlight, I believe, I can, I will, just watch me. Yeah. And that was part of the turning point yeah. for you. Do you advise writing down your goals? Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. I was probably a bigger one of it back then when I first started my business also, but definitely goals. I went to see Anthony Stewart after I got dropped and the club said, you should go and see this guy, sports psychologist. I said, okay, yep. anything to help you improve, I'm in. And uh, yeah, he taught me straight away, I can, I will, you just watch me. So not just watch me, you just watch me. So that you sort of made, I think, a bit of a difference also and highlighted that in my diary every day. So it was something for me to go out there, just even with a goal of even a training, whether it was marking or kicking. So I used to turn up an hour earlier and just if tonight was marking, it was like, all right, 
I'd get Wayne Britton or Barry Mitchell and say, right, let's go. Let's kick, 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 mark, mark, mark. And then when I was out there, try not to, you know, drop not one single mark. So it's funny when you've got to focus like that, how much your training improves instead of just going out there just for the sake of going out. Here's a few minutes from my chat with Steve McKnight of propertyinvesting.com from episode nine. His thoughts on money, money habits, happiness, common investing mistakes, and why some people give up. What the world probably needs is a bit of a wake-up call that maybe our thoughts and attitudes around money that we've kind of picked up along the way, either by friends or family, and I call that money influences, um, or our money programming, which is just how we use money, uh, isn't actually leading us to an outcome that we're happy with. You know, the saying is, the more you do of what you've done, the more you get of what you've got. So if you keep playing the money game the way you're playing it at the moment, you will have more of what you have already. And for most people, they're not happy with that. They want something different. Well, if you want something different, you've got to change. And I think it's not about going and just buying a a great piece of real estate and everything will be all right. You've got to change these habits, thoughts around money first, and then you'll find you're investing a lot easier. I mean, I've spent the last 20 years showing people how to make money out of real estate, but sometimes people will make a lot of money, but they're not a lot happier. Or they'll make a lot of money and they'll they'll lose a lot of money because they make it, but then they spend it. They don't keep it. So it's some of these foundational issues that I'm finding I'm a little bit more passionate about than showing people how to make $100,000 out of a property deal and then hoping that life's all right. What do you see most common with people in their, when they start out, they've got to get their uh, money and I suppose goals aligned. Is there any common thing that you see that we're missing? Yeah, as uh, difficult as it is to answer, I think money only makes sense if it's got a reason. Uh, Again, the the thought is, I don't know what I want to do with my life, but I know if I had more money, I'd be happier. Well, that's different to having a reason for having money and then figuring out how to get there. For instance, you may decide that you want to support a life-saving organisation down at the beach somewhere and that they need a new piece of equipment that's going to cost $100,000. And so now in your brain, you think, right, how can I raise $100,000? What can I do to get that $100,000? How can I invest in real estate? So the outcome provides a context for how you go about generating the money Yep. versus I just want $100,000, I don't have any real purpose for it and I don't really care how it comes, doesn't give you a context for your investing. And one of the mistakes I see people make is they just keep doing what they're doing, as I've mentioned, because they want more money, but they don't know why they want more money. They just think it'll make them happier. And it doesn't. It's a myth. Having more money doesn't make people happier. Don't get me wrong, I say money can't buy happiness, but it can buy business class, right? So it's (laughs) something nice about sitting in business class or having a nice car or a nice house. But sooner or later, the inner need of your soul can't be fed by money. It has to be fed by uh, one of two things. It needs to be fed by accomplishment, which means like you, you add meaning to your life, or it needs to be met by service, which is what you can do for other people. Okay. And if you don't have those things in your life, I think that sooner or later you just feel unfulfilled. It, le- it leads to a crisis of some sort, like like you're not doing something worthwhile. It's harder to work out what you're doing is what you're saying than how to get there. It's harder to, to find a reason for doing something. And, and this might be an insight for the people listening along, Matt. Uh, It was around 2006 and I was going through a bit of a life crisis. My father-in-law was passing away with with prostate cancer. I was questioning, I'd I'd achieved a lot in real estate already and money wasn't a motivating factor for me anymore. And I was asking myself, you know, what do you do in life if you don't have to worry about money? Uh, Particularly in the midst of a bit of a personal crisis within a family. And I was sitting down with a mentor of mine, a guy by the name of Brendan Nichols, which I highly recommend anyone listening to this uh, Google, Brendan Nichols. Uh, Brendan is a guy who's been in the wealth creation industry for a long, long time, and and he's helped me at a personal level uh, on many occasions. And I was with um, Bren up in Coffs Harbour, and we're just sitting on the headland overlooking the ocean talking about this. And I said, Bren, why is it that people give up? Often people make a little bit of progress and then they throw their hands in the air and they retreat. They go back to the way things were. And we bounced around some ideas and in the end we decided that people give up when the pain of going forward is greater than the pain of going back. 
So one of the ways to prevent yourself from backsliding is to create such a painful experience that the pain of going back is greater than the pain of going forward. Yep. And that's what I did with accounting and I hated accounting so much. It's not that I was bad at it. I just, it, it was just so stressful Yeah. that there was a lot of pain associated with letting go of the security of an accounting career and moving into something that I didn't know how to do. But compared to the pain of staying in accounting, it was not as great. So that kept me going forward. Well, coming back here, unless people have a reason for doing something that gives a context for the hard work and the sacrifice that's necessary for success, then after, it's like a diet, after a month or two and you've lost a little bit of weight, you go back to eating chocolate. Yeah. After one or two good investments and then all of a sudden you've got a bank account with $250,000 in it, you think, well, my life's pretty good now. I will um, go and buy something and, and fill my life with stuff that doesn't really matter. And again, to quote from Brendan for a second here, the enemy of a great life is a good life. So what happens is people make a little bit of progress, they end up with a good life, but they never get to a great life because then they settle for lukewarm. So all, what I'm about is helping people understand that money is a tool. Like any tool, it is only useful in the hands of someone who knows how to use it. And if it's in the hands of someone who doesn't know how to use it, then it might actually cause some damage. So we're not born great drivers, most of us, or born great guitar players, or born exceptional husbands or wives. We need skill. Money's no yep. different. And the, what I've found is the more skill someone has around money, the better they are with making it multiply. And similarly, the less skill they have, the less able they are to make it multiply. But it seems to me that when it comes to money, and coming back to your point before about it not being taught in school, it's expected that you're good at it, but that's an unrealistic expectation because you've never been trained properly in how to use it. Yeah, I agree with that, yeah. And even accountants, Matt, they, they know debits and credits and a financial planner can come up with a plan for you, but that doesn't mean that they necessarily know it themselves and or, or are living it. They've just learned it, but they're not applying it. Here's a snippet from episode 10. TV producer and co-host Walt Collins on learning lines, connecting with audiences and being on TV. With the, with the work you do on camera, is there a lot of learning of lines, a lot of prep work? Because it seems that you've got different shows going on, you're hosting different shows, producing different shows, doing your carpentry apprenticeship. How do you remember like, wh where you are? How do you remember what you're doing today? In terms of like remembering and getting, getting, your, getting present in each moment, is that a challenge? Yeah, yeah, it really is. Um, and you can ask Danny, my co-host as well, like we've, we've really gotten our groove on now. So series five, like we can just run our eye over a script a couple of times and have a basic understanding of the key points that have to be said. And then the rest of it, we do try and put into as much conversation as we can. Sometimes a script is so legally demanding. You can't say a word wrong because it's been approved by 20 lawyers. If it's something for like a product, which needs to be spoken about properly as part oh, well. of the advertising codes, for example, we had Metamucil. Yeah, so Metamucil is a therapeutic goods, uh, whatever it is, the TGA approved um, product. Fibre supplement. Fibre supplement. Yeah. So if you say something like, this product will help you be feel better. Uh, may help you. Yes, it yeah. may help you. Yeah. And there's all these words which we're fed, which we don't know in advertising, that if you go back and say, well, it didn't help me at all, actually. And they go, yeah, well, it doesn't matter. We said, what? we said could, would, maybe, might you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Otherwise, we just try and make it as conversational as we can. My brain has now been trained for being a complete sieve from having massive night outs in my 20s, you know, drinking too much vodka, not being able to remember my pin code, <laughs> to remembering three three pages of dialogue. It's amazing how you can train your brain. And how have you, how have you trained that? Because I know for myself, when you get super busy and you, you tend to just get a little bit, or for myself anyway, I don't know if I speak for anyone else, but I can tend to get foggy and everything. So how do you... How do you do all those things and, and get that clarity? Is there a system behind it? Is there a I'd love to say, I, you know, I eat peanuts and I concentrate and meditate and all this kind of stuff, but I don't. And I'll use the analogy back to my trade. You know, my, my builder, Dave, can know every code. He'll go, oh, no, it's over 1,800, so we need two braces on there. I'm like, how do you remember that? How do you remember that it needs to be laminated in a triple LVL or whatever it might be? You know, how do you remember that that's right? It's just years of training. It becomes like a second nature. It becomes like learning, you know, because the thing is with TV is every camera angle, everything you do with your face, 
your hands, your body, your lips, when you lick your lips, when you blink, <laughs> which way you hold your head means something to a viewer because they're watching your body language because they're not in front of you. They're heightened to every single thing that you do as part of the way we've evolved from monkeys. It's instincts, it's about reading code, it's about reading body language. So everything I do is read. So they'll know when I'm bullshitting because I'll hold my hands in a funny way and they'll just go, this bloke's absolutely full of rubbish. He's got no idea what he's talking about. You've got to be believable and remember your script. And if you can connect those together, the, the believing in your product and believing in what you're saying, then you have success. Otherwise, you end up just a generic presenter that's reading an auto cue, has got no soul behind what they're saying, and that's definitely not who I am. Jade Ingleby and Hayley Bishop both have very successful professional careers and are mothers. They joined me for episode 11 to discuss juggling work and family. You have to kind of, I guess, be used to not sleeping as much. <laughs> it's probably one thing. Yeah. Um, but I think you also have to start to be kinder to yourself because it's it's a really hard balance of trying to accept that you trying to be the best worker you can, but also the best mum and wife and friend and family member and all those other things is, is a really tough balance. And I think you just have to be kind to yourself to say you can't do everything to the nth degree. So you have to prioritise what those things are that are the most important to you and just make sure you focus on, on delivering those and not get caught up on the, the mm. small stuff because you just don't have the time. And do you have a system for that? Is it like a, is it a daily checklist? Do you write it down? Is it is a mental thing that family is more important than work or vice versa? Or how do you actually process that? Yeah, I'm I'm very lucky. I mean, I guess even moving into this job, I my boss was wonderful and sort of said the way I see it, you know, family's number one, no matter what. Um, you know, I hope jobs sort of round that two level because it helps give you the lifestyle and everything else you want for your family. Um, but yeah, there's that understanding that you know, if you have to be somewhere, you have to be somewhere and we'll, and we'll navigate it. But as a result, you put in and more and you just have to juggle, I guess, you know. But to your point, I have I love lists. Um, but in saying that, I've sometimes you don't even have the time or the luxury to sit back and actually mm. think about it that much. So you get better at mentally doing it. Mm. Um, and I find that it helps if I've done it at night so that I'm not waking up in the morning going, oh, like, you know, how am I planning my day and getting that anxiety? So I almost feel like, right, they're my things in the morning I just have to get done and then we'll think about that next stage, mm. um, which I think Jade and I are both very organised, driven, con like we like control. Um, and I think probably the way that we have self-improved um, to manage this different life stage is we've had to say, okay, I can't have all of that, um, but I can bring in parts of it to get the most out of what's in front of me, but I also need to kind of evolve and change. Mm. Um, otherwise I'd go insane. Yeah, I think in addition to that, some things that I probably have done being my own boss now, so there's no boss telling me I can or can't do anything. So I've got to be quite accountable to myself, which I find probably in a way, <sighs> whether I'm harder on myself or I work harder now because it actually does just stop with me. So what goes in my business bank account, I guess, it ultimately ends with me. So there is that level of um, responsibility. But for the organisation perspective, I do one thing now that I never used to do and I ask for help and I get help uh, from my husband or my uh uh, you know, family members or whatever it might be, and I've just stopped worrying about being not being perceived as the best mother in the world because I need someone to cook dinner or I need to order Uber Eats on a Wednesday night or uh, I need exactly what Hayley said, you just have to be kinder to yourself and not think you have to be cooking a three-course meal when you get home from a long day of work because... You know, what's the point of that when you could be spending time with your kids and, you know, someone on their bike can deliver Uber Eats to you and you're all eating a healthy meal and then, you know, you've got that quality time. And I think by reprioritising the things that are in your control and what, uh, I guess, again, come back to the end game, what's going to make you happy in your, your family, that's the main thing. So then things like lists, yes, I am a fan of Excel, Anyone who knows me, Excel spreadsheet is my best friend. So I have um, Excel calendars on the fridge and everyone knows what's going on and, you know, in case the world ended, um, you know, someone knew where music lessons were or whatever it might be. So 
Um, I've had to let a, let go a lot of a lot of things that I used to um, feel like were super important as being seen as a capable, successful mother. But I realise now that I am that. I just do it differently to perhaps others. Um, so once you can come to terms with that, it's a lot happier place to be. Episode 12, here's four-time Bathurst 1000 champion Steve Richards on growing up in a famous racing family, dealing with the expectations of others and dinner table conversations with his dad, Jim. Other moments are, you don't think, again, you don't think of it at the time, but it's a pretty cool st- I, I drove three times at Bathurst in the 1000k race with my dad. And in sport, in many other sports, that just doesn't happen. It happens in motor racing because... Unlike other um, sports people, we, we, we don't burn out knees. We don't, um, if you're physically fit and able and mentally in good shape, you can drive, you can drive through, through two or three generations of, of, um, of people. And in 1997, Dad and I drove together and we finished second. We stood on the podium at Bathurst in second. Now at the time, he's just, he's just the guy that's helping you and your team achieve a result. You don't think of the, the how special it was actually standing up there on the podium with him, nearly having won Australia's biggest biggest race. So that that's nice to look back on now. You come from a famous racing family. What was it like growing up under your dad, Jim? Because Jim Richards, along with Peter Brock and Dick Johnson, are probably three of the real famous names in, in history of Australian motorsport, but yep. certainly through that era. Yeah. Uh, I guess I didn't know any different. So it wasn't a big deal. I, I, I spent all, all of my years as a, as, a, as a kid, you know, our annual family holiday was, was to Bathurst. For the race. For, for the race. Right, that, yeah. that, was, that was what we did. Or, or we went back over Christmas, we went back to New Zealand, which is where Dad, Mum and Dad were from originally, to go and visit family. But aside from that, it was Bathurst. So I, you know, I, I, I grew up around all those guys. I didn't see them as in the same light that perhaps the race fans saw them in. They were just, they were just people, you know, they were just out there driving and, and I had no concept even as a teenager as to their standing in the sporting arena in Australia. So when I started doing my racing, I didn't start my go-kart, my go-karting until I was 15. I, I, I kind of, didn't have an expectation and I worked out early on that when I didn't have an expectation but I realised early on that other people that may have had an expectation that really I couldn't change what people thought and I couldn't or the only thing I could do was go out every every time and do the best I could regardless of where it was. You figured that out back then at yeah, 15 yeah, when you yeah, started. For sure. Yeah, yeah, and, and and dad, you know, even even to the point where when I was doing the go karting, I had to do it on my. Oh no, don't get me wrong. I, I I didn't do it on my own. I I but I had to work hard at it because dad was away racing most weekends. So if I wanted to go go karting and, and have a good time, there was no, you know, at that point in time I was 15. I was been riding motorbikes for a while. I was mucking around with my my own motorbikes in the garage. I had some sense of of working on things, nuts and bolts, because I'd been around it the whole time. And the go-karting thing really, because Dad was always away, and not only away racing, but during the week, doing promotional bits and pieces, that I had to do it myself. If, if the go-kart was going to get to the track, if Mum or Dad were, uh, had, the, had the time to get me to the track, I was going to have to do it on my own. So early on, early on I was pretty well just as a, you know, as a 15-year-old going to the circuit with, with a mate of mine who bought a go-kart at the same time as a few years older and, and then got his licence. So that was my way to get to the track. And we'd just go out practising and racing and driving every weekend. And I didn't care what other people really... If, if, they were, if there was a perception about me and, and my driving, I, I, I didn't care. I was going out doing what I, what I enjoyed every weekend of the, year, of, of, of the month or the year, having a good time. Then all of a sudden... From that, opportunities opened up into car racing. And even those opportunities, while they were supported by mum and dad, dad didn't have a lot of time to, to, 
to, to be involved, not, not support me, be involved. I had all the support from my family, but he couldn't be involved in it because he was doing his own thing. So that's sort of how it started. And, and I never, you know, it was probably in my, probably my late into the second year of m my car racing um, program where I was still working as a mechanic, an apprentice mechanic at Moorabbin Airport, aircraft mechanic. Yep. And I started to realise that maybe there was some sort of hope of, of making a career out of it. I started to get some results and things moved in the right direction, a little bit of sponsorship. And then that, that was probably the catalyst for, for taking it on. But I've always just been happy with who I am and, and, and strived, strived to be the best that I can in anything I do. And, and I guess trying to emulate the lofty heights of dad who has done everything and won everything and, and been successful everywhere was going to be a pretty hard, hard task. So I was just pretty happy doing what I was doing and, and over that time managed to, managed to have my, you know, forge my own path and, and have some decent results. In terms of your relationship now with your dad, do you talk racing as equals or is there still a bit of that father-son hierarchy where he, I don't know, maybe he leans in at the dinner table and says, <laughs> bit wide into turn three, son, or whatever. He, he yeah, says, probably, do, you t do you talk as equals now? Yeah, yeah, we do. And probably not so, I mean, you know, def definitely in the early years, that, that was a big part of our dinner conversation was asking specific things about that. But um, no, now, now, now we enjoy our car racing together. Dad, dad in his, is still driving and probably in his... In, in enjoying his motor racing more than ever. He's not, not um, in that cutting edge competitive must, must succeed thing. He's more about going out and enjoying himself and, and promoting the partners that he has involved with him. But um, we, we talk about everything, Formula One, um, historic racing, sports cars. And, and he, he, because, and I'm like dad in the fact that if he wasn't driving cars, he would be a motorsport fan and he, he would have been involved in some way in motor racing, but it's just the way the tables work. So, yeah, I mean, we, we, have, a, you know, we, we have a general interest in the automotive landscape, whether it's cars, motor racing, bikes, that's how we've grown up and, it, and we, we just have good, good banter. Educator Brendan Nichols shared some of his thoughts on money and success. This clip is from episode 13 on using strategies and structures for running businesses and building wealth. We hear so much that, you know, one of the uh, quote secrets, if you like, to success is doing something you love, aligning your passion with, with something that earns a lot of money, but you went about it a little bit differently used a business to get you to a point where you no longer need to work anymore so then you could follow your true passion if you like is that a fair statement at, at that stage i would say that i wasn't i wasn't completely financially independent like you know before i switched into education i mean i was making really good money at, in real estate and i had a lot of success but that's how i learned this lesson about success and money because i had I was making really good money. What I, what I find about people who are driven by a success driver is they're really good at making money. They're really good at spending it too. They're really good at spending it on cars and, and stuff. And so I fell more into that category. And so I believe it's a little controversial. I, I, teach, I teach people what I call strategies, but I teach them structure. So... This is probably useful for your listeners because if you either either want to become successful or if you want to become wealthy, you're going to have to do a combination of learning strategies and structures. So, for example, if you were a real estate investor, you would need strategies on, you know, how to specifically invest. You know, would you be um, building a granny flat out the back or would you be doing, you know, a, a sixplex, you know, unit development, all these specific strategies on how you would do it. But if you were a business person, you would need the same. So, you know, as a business person, I teach people, you know, there's things you need to know. How do I do a Facebook ad? How, how do I write long copy sales letter? How do I do, um, how would I do publicity? I mean, I have one client that's, I taught a technique to that's got over $700,000 
worth of free publicity. And these are specific strategies. But more importantly, what I teach than the strategies is your structure, which is your mindset, your habits, your beliefs. And that's that's actually, that will determine the course of your entire life. You can know all the strategies in the world. And, and this we're now getting into something that's not my opinion. This is empirical fact based on me training over 30,000 businesses. Unless your structure is right, your habits, your mindsets, beliefs, that those strategies never seem to come to fruition. So primarily what I do in a lot of my advanced groups is that, yes, we're giving people either that want to get into business or are in business, we are giving them cutting-edge strategies, particularly marketing strategies, direct response marketing strategies. But most of the work that we're doing is is attempting to change that their structure. And so we've seen massive gains by combining this strategy structure approach. Here's Stefan Gazakis of Business Benchmark Group from episode 14 on delegation and managing the perfect calendar. And if you're the owner of a business, um, so, sometimes the fallacy is, oh, no, no, I've got it. If it's meant to be, it's up to me. Or, you know, if I work harder, they'll work harder. And that's just, that that was true in the 1970s and even 1960s. Yep. But where we are right now, delegation and, and giving people an opportunity to, uh, you know, perform better today at what it is that they're responsible for is, is, is the way of the game and, and the way of the game going forward. So the better I stick to what I'm really good at, and empower you and give you an opportunity to be better at what you're doing today so you have a better version of it tomorrow, that's definitely going to win the game. So the tool the tool that we generally refer to is a um, what would your perfect calendar look like? So in the first book that I wrote, I, I really go into detail around what does a perfect calendar look like? Now, perfect calendar isn't about utopia or let's sit by the campfire singing kumbaya. I mean, this is business and it's about 40 hours, 50 hours, 60 hours of highly effective, highly efficient time being used. Now, because we're humans, there's going to be downtime. There's going to be interruption time. There's going to be distraction time. So if we look at our our perfect calendars and say, okay, what would it look like if 70% of our hours in the business were very focused on our top three to five activities? Okay, so you're not even shooting for 100% from the start. No chance. There okay. is, no, I mean, 23 years down the track in being a student to the perfect calendar model, I'm striking at about 86% right now. Okay. So our meeting this morning was at 9.30. Yep. We started at 9.32. Well, you're late. That's correct. <laughs> So that's not as bad as 70%, though, is it? No, that's right. <laughs> so, so so it's okay. Again, the unforgiving aspect of, oh, no, I need to be regimented. No, we're human beings. We need to give ourselves a flexibility of not being perfect, and this is where half the issue is. So if I create a calendar that's 70% perfect and then every other day I am measuring in the actual, one's the perfect calendar, the other one's the actual, yep. what am I doing versus what I thought I would be doing? How am I executing versus what I thought I'd be executing? How am I trending as a ratio? No different to a financial budget. Yes. What did I think will happen versus what is actually happening? So think of time as money, which is actually what it is anyway. So. Yeah. And think of money in 60-minute increments. So 60 minutes on, 30 minutes off. 60 minutes on, 30 minutes off. Now, that roughly equals 60, 66%. I don't want to get too caught up in the numbers here. Yes. But it just paints a picture. Because as human beings, you will get that mobile phone ringing. You will have an urge to go to the toilet. You might need to have a break, and you should. So if you think about 60 minutes on, but highly effective, what are the two, three things I'm doing in this 60 minutes? And this is the desired outcome, plan. Uh-huh. What's actually happening? So that's, that's a methodology or a tool that we call the perfect calendar. But only three to five key activities throughout the week. So... A lot of business owners that would come to you, I'm assuming, would have a list that's a lot longer than three to five, right? So you have to get rid of the other 10 or 15. What's the process of doing that? Well, we, we, we help them understand, okay, on a, on, a, on, a typical, on a typical day, in a typical month, what are the top 10 things that you do? Yeah, and what would be an example of a couple of, of those? Uh, buying the milk for the fridge, opening the doors in the morning, yep. signing the cheque, making the best sale. Uh, handing over to the operations team, occasionally getting caught up in the operational team, writing the invoice, 
ring in the, the, the debtor to collect the, 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 uh, the payment are some of your typical, just loosely speaking. Yep. And what we say is, okay, well, that, that's coverage across the three key areas of business. Uh -huh. What is it as a leader and an owner that are your most relevant three? Okay. So we get them to make a list of ten and then we say, okay, pick your relevant three. And what's the relevant three? The ones that you have better income generating opportunity, better highly rate in, uh, in, in, in dollar terms, what is the value that you provide makes it the relevant three. So for most owners, particularly business owners that are running businesses under $10 million, under $20 million, Matt, the most relevant thing that they do is keep on focusing on growing resources, so growing people. Yeah. If I'm investing an hour with you, if you're on my team and I'm investing an hour with you every week, half an hour with you every week, just confirming how are you going versus how you could be going. What is it that you need to share with me so that I'm understanding you better? How is it that I can provide better tools for you? How is it that we as a team, as an organisation, could be performing better? Yep. If I'm investing one hour with you every week, that's roughly about 46 to 48 hours a, a year. What do you think happens to you if you're on my team? If I'm on your team, I'm first of all going to feel that my uh, opinion and my voice is heard and that I have a at least an opportunity to make a contribution to where we're going. Correct. And, and if that is what um, occurs mentally, then physically we're going to be in a position where you contribute more okay. because it's a live yep. conversation week on week. Yep. So that's called growing resources. And most business owners, they would love to do it or even the ones that feel that they've got a dysfunctional team and they can't believe that these guys are on their team, and guys means girls as well, by the way. Yes. Um, so they, they neglect the most important task in their business, and that's growing people. As it is, in most small businesses, um, the, the owner of the business in the first and second and third phase of business, they are the best front man or salesperson in their business. They make it easy for the outside world to buy in because they still have the underlying passion for their business. They're the best representative for their business. So that's how we, we, we ensure that our business owners and leaders ensure that they're creating a list that's called what are the top ten things that you do each week and how do we sandwich that down to the relevant three, which is an hourly rate identity. And if we focus on what is your highest hourly rate identity yep. by three to five key activities, yep. what that actually means is we start shaping your diary, your perfect diary, against those threes. And guess what? Why don't you pick two more that you love doing yep. and we'll keep them as number four and number five. You're allowed to do them but only 10% of the week. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's structuring. Um, it's probably structuring what you know you should be doing but never get around to doing it. Correct. Because we're always caught up in the urgent. So this um, – th so the – Delegation, um, come back to the delegation question, those other things need to be done by other people. So if, it's if, you, a if it's a delegation, if it's a delegation and you're in small business, you're not at a stage where a robot will do it. Yep. There is an opportunity to keep on improving systems and by systems is also an aspect of automation. So there is an element of system improvement. And our saying is great systems followed by good people that know what they're there to do yep. and ultimately are clear about their responsibilities yes. and how they get measured for results. So great systems, good people, eventually great systems, great people, yep. influencing a better version of great systems. And that's how we keep on lifting the standard. One grows the other. Totally. But, but, but the very and most important part about that is you've got to be okay to be investing in systems. This next one is from episode 15 and my conversation with property developer Dave Bradley. He breaks down the capital gains and cash flow real estate investment strategies, including his thoughts on both. There was a, a specific uh, moment where things changed and I rec remember it like it was yesterday being the case. And so it was about 2001 and I remember it because it was the birth of my second child and I missed because I was buying properties. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> and I bought three blocks of flats. And I uh, bought three blocks of flats in Tasmania and I paid something like, I don't know exactly what I paid, I paid $640,000 for them. I remember the numbers really well. Remember, I'm the accountant, I can remember numbers. <laughs> for all three? For all three blocks of flats. Yep. And they were returning about 100 grand a year in cash flow. And, uh, and I was chatting with a buddy of mine and I, and he said, and I said, this stuff's going to be worth a million bucks. He says, mate, it's Tasmania. The, the capital growth has been flat forever. It, it, they're worth what you paid for them. And I said, I disagree. Anyway, so I said, I reckon they're worth more. I chat to Steve and he goes, no, we don't sell, we don't sell, we don't sell. And so I went to market 
and we had a, well, I'll say, a fairly robust discussion about whether you should <laughs> sell or, you know, you should lose that cash flow of the rent of 100 grand and all that sort of stuff. Uh, I went to market and I sold them for a little under $1.2 million. So you in, effectively... In, in, in about 18 months. You doubled your money in well, I did months, more months. than double my money because that, that was ignoring leverage because I had leverage involved. My money went from... You know, it, it would have multiplied by fourfold or something like that in uh-huh. that case. And so... Uh, that was about an 18-month period. So what I'd said to well, my recollection or my justification to Steve to sell it to the other director, if you like, was to say, just look at it like we're getting 30 years' worth of cash flow in one day. Ah, I've never heard of it explained that way. Interesting, yeah, okay. And so what it did is if, and I remember the numbers, I had about $200,000 in this deal and I borrowed about 440000 and I walked away with, I think, $700,000 or something like that. And what it allowed me to do was to take was I turn two hundred into seven hundred in eighteen months. Yep. Now people, some people are going to listen to this. Go, oh yeah, well played, the rich get richer. Well, good on you, Dave. Ego. No, no, no. That, that's what happened. Yep. The realization was that I went. If my yield it doesn't matter what return I get on my assets, if I can keep turning two hundred to seven hundred and seven hundred into one point, and so on and so forth, it doesn't matter what my my yield is. So if you looked at it in a really, really, really basic sense, people people understand yield and return on invest and return generally. Yes. So if, if a person says I want to get a ten percent return on my money, okay, let's come back a different way. If a per, most, most seminars I ever spoke at have been to, most people want to earn an income, a passive income of hundred grand a year. It tends to be like nine out of ten seminar participants say it, 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 yeah. it's there. If you needed hundred thousand dollars as your as your income goal, and, and you could make a ten percent return on your money, you'd need a million dollars of assets. Fairly simple mathematics yeah. in the case. Uh, and and so if you if you, you know, if you if that would make you ten percent. If you had five hundred thousand, the numbers would go <laughs> accordingly as you went through the numbers. Of course. So yeah. people would focus on their cash flow goal. They would focus on I needed hundred thousand dollars. Was I, what I discovered around that time was. If I, the cash flow will take care of itself, so that it, the, so the the numerator to go back to your yin on maths yes. will take care of itself, provided you take care of the denominator. So if your denominator is so big, it doesn't matter what rate of return you're going to get on your on your assets, you'll actually achieve your goal. So most people are focusing on the cash flow, and what I what my, my transition away from that was I started focusing on focusing on my net worth or my net assets or the denominator <laughs> rather than the numerator or the positive cash flow effect. Does that make sense? So what you're saying is that if you if you have enough assets, the cash flow will take care of itself. Yeah. And I went and I had this transaction where I went, wow, that is, I've just made a truckload of money in a short period of time and I reckon I can replicate it. So if I keep doing that and that and that and that and that, the actual cash flow that I walk away with from rental streams or whatever else will take care of itself because I can make 200 into 700. So even though you had you actively had to do that, time and time again because yeah. when you're looking for passive income, you know, you, you want that, as you said, $100,000 a year coming in but you don't want to have to do anything for it, right? Whereas you weren't worried about actively doing it if you could build your asset base at this faster rate. Correct. And so when I when I build – so what I'm doing right now, I'm trying to build my asset base at a faster rate. So I'm taking a house. Let's call it I pay for a million dollars. It doesn't matter what I pay for it. And I'm yeah. trying to turn it into three houses. So I'm trying to turn my capital in that house – into a multiple yes. of that capital in that house. Now, I either read or heard, and don't ask me where because I can't remember, <laughs> that you actually don't hold, so you've gone from holding at one point hundreds of properties to now you don't have yep. any rentals I have a or, couple, or yeah. very few. I have a couple of rentals, but mainly the rentals are there waiting for planning, the properties waiting for planning permits to come through. So that's just making money because of the circumstances or taking advantage so, of that. And, if you, you know, again, a separate podcast about the rental laws and about the rights that they have versus the returns that you actually get. You can see why people would go with the amount of you know, rubbish you've got to put up with from other rental agents or tenants. Yes. This is not a poor landlord story. This is just the practicalities of what happens that you go. I can see why people just don't do not do that. So yeah. you're correct, man. I... I have a couple, but nothing that I would say is a uh, is for the long term there. So, I'm ref- I, when I'm working on a daily basis, I'm working towards my end game. Your end game, I'm thinking, at some point has to turn back into that cash flow model, doesn't Correct. it? It does do. But right now, so if I've got, a, let's say, I've got a hundred thousand dollars of capital that I can go and place in the market. Yep. So I've got a number of choices. I can go and put it into what I call an active asset, or I can go and develop a property, and I can multiply it at, at a rate and make a return of whatever I can make in that. Or I can go and buy a rental property. And so right now, I say the amount of money I can make from an active asset 
versus a passive asset is more in the active asset. So I'm better off putting it into a property development, doing the development, coming out with a bigger pot, b- bigger pot of capital, my denominator, that eventually when I get closer to my end game, I will go, you know what, I'll just go and buy passive assets and sit there if my, if my denominator is so big and my, my net asset base is so big. Because you have traded up all your assets, you're going to have a bigger cash flow, Correct. so you win in the end. Correct. In terms of risk between the two strategies, is it riskier to go with this development model in your opinion or not? Uh, I say it's not. It's a really good question. I say it's not because I, I think I'm in control of my own destiny. And okay. I'm, and I, so I'm comfortable with the risk that, that I'm taking on that's there. For other people, they might not. So risk is, you know, one of these you know, funny things about what is what is risk. And so I say when, you know, people invest in my projects that, you know, we're, we're trying to actually minimise the risk all the time. So what we're trying to do is get a rate of return adjusted for the risk that we're taking on. And everything you do has a risk associated. So in a development you will have a finance risk, a development risk, a settlement risk, a building risk. There's all these risks that you actually have. And so you're actually getting paid to take on those risks as opposed to just going, buying a property and putting a tenant in. Now, the thing is not, you actually got to take the risk. I think you need to, A, understand what the risk is and what the risk can do to you and B, then go and manage that risk and have a plan yeah. for that risk. So when people say it's risky or is it risky, Dave, it must be risky for you or a comment thereof, what they're saying is that sounds risky to me. I don't know how to manage the risk. Where I'm saying, no, I actually understand what the risk is and I'm going to do my utmost to actually minimise that risk or at least recognise it and have a plan for if something was to happen and I have to actually then enforce risk minimisation. So you've obviously considered it and comfortable with it and hence you're doing what you're doing. Correct. Stuart Lord of Lockerlec discussed his early days in business, getting creative and solving problems during episode 16. We were sort of pottering along. You were just doing those trolley yeah. drivers at yeah, the time? Yeah, trolley drives, things like that. So... Yeah. I remember um, we did have a hospital bed mover in its basic form as well. I ended up a lot of cold calling, all that sort of stuff, really trying to get out there and push the envelope and blah, blah, blah. And I managed to get a um, into one hospital locally, quite a big one. And the guy, obviously, I was very young. I was only 23 or something. Um, and he really believed in how genuine... I was in and I want to try and help your solutions in your workplace. And he ended up giving us a um, – we were living week to week, that's for sure. So he ended up giving us an order um, for quite a – about 100 grand and they paid I think 30% up front just before Christmas and it was one of the first Christmas times that we've actually had, you know, we could we could enjoy Christmas. Unfortunately, the 30% was probably the margin. So <laughs> three months later, four months later, when we tried to start Deliver, it was obviously hard. We didn't really have the funds to, because we had to pay a lot of debt off and all that sort of stuff. So I remember that moment, that's for sure. But it, was, it, was, it wasn't as simple as starting a fresh company because every single time we got a run on the board, there was always some skeleton that came in through the closet that I didn't know about. So to the point where, you know, I'd be drive. We didn't have a car that could get to Sydney because they were in such bad condition, all the vehicles. So I used to do camper van relocations to actually. So I would have a power drive where I had to go to Sydney to install them. So it was for, it was like a little medication cart. I remember um, getting into uh, organising a camper van relocation because there was no way in hell any of our cars could make it and drove all the way to uh, Sydney, fitted it, screwed it on, blah, 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 got it fitted, then got the check from the nursing home and quick clearanced. And um, I remember putting it into the bank and it cleared. And then I was like, okay, that's great. That's good. But then um, I don't know what happened. Obviously, there was a the thing was overdrawn. So I was stuck in Sydney. But I managed to somehow get another couple hundred bucks to get back. And uh, that's how it was for many, many years. So it was very uh, difficult times, to say the very least. But never, ever lost, never felt like it was too much. I, I knew it was difficult what I was doing. But there was always looking for the next challenge. That's for sure. So you use the camper van relocation to go to a place where you need to do an install. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I remember it's having... It's a pretty smart idea. That's oh, yeah, quite, yeah. That's, and that's quite good. good. I was like a, that. $2 a day. It was amazing. So yeah, right. you only had to pay for the petrol and return it to... Um, yeah, it was, it, was a, it was pretty clever. So you had to do it in uh, two days. So you couldn't really go touring around or anything. You could yeah. go to Marimbula and play golf or 
anything like that. So, yeah, that was the sort of way if I had to drive interstate, I would always uh, find a camper van and do that. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Episode 17 was all about being new in business, developing the right attitude and generating work when you have no contacts. Here's Ben Walton Healy of Aqua Blue Plumbing. Suddenly I was exposed, within five minutes I was exposed to a new element of business, which working for someone I never had to really prove myself or sell yourself, sell myself. And I left that office and with the most bizarre feeling because um, I thought, I don't know if that went as well as I would have liked it to. As you, as you know, you can never control these situations. But I had a gut feeling deep down that I knew I was onto something good and I couldn't let this opportunity slip. And it was an opportunity that I'd been fortunate enough to be given, but it was also an opportunity for me to prove myself. So basically, I, I live not on the other side of town, but I do live probably, you know, a good 30-minute drive from, from that particular office in, South, in uh, South Yarra or Turak. And the next day, I got up at 7.30 and I thought, if something comes to this, I'm going to make it happen. And, um, and I drove across to around the corner from the office and I sat there and I waited in my car for the first job to come in via email. So you went down there, you didn't, you didn't actually have a job, you went down I didn't there. Have, I didn't have a job. Fingers crossed that the phone would ring. Fingers crossed and I sat in my car and I, you know, I think I think I bought the 7-Eleven coffee because, uh, I, I, you know. Keeping you take, expenses low. Keeping those expenses <laughs> low and, course, um, yeah. and sat there and, and fortunate enough one came in. And Do you remember what it was? What was the job? Uh, it was a roof leak. Okay. It yeah. was a roof leak that came in and I, I sent an email back within two minutes, I reckon it was, saying I'd contacted the tenant of this particular property and I was on my way. And um, I went there and I sorted the job out. I fixed it as promised and uh, and really tried to emphasise on providing a good service, polite service, um, clean you know, I was I turned up. Um, that's one thing I really pride myself on with my business is uh, everyone has clean uniforms. Although we're doing dirty work, we need to be clean. And um, and I completed the job. And uh, and I called the land, uh, sorry, the property owner, and said you can notify the landlord. It's all been fixed. And that was done within an hour and a half, man. Yeah. And um, and this particular property. Manager. Pro- manager basically said to me, oh, I've got another one. So off I went again and then again. And I think that first day I ticked three off, three jobs. And I, and I drove home and I knew I knew this was it. I knew this was my opportunity. Still didn't have a job tomorrow, but I did that particular day. So you got, did you say you got two or three that first day? Uh, three. Three, three the first know, day? Three that first day. Okay. That's not bad. No, no, it was, uh, that was, you know, it was more than, more than I'd had, you know, and uh, yeah. it was really exciting. So then I turned around and um, woke up the next day, did the same thing, drove across. And then I think, look, and then I might have gone one for the next day, then five then six, and then suddenly it just started to roll. I got introduced to more people, more property managers. Within the office and the organisation. Within the office and the organisation. And I know this is said a million times um, on this podcast, but good people introduced me to good people. And I provided a service that I knew purely stood by the values and the morals of Cane Burton Real Estate Agency which they pride themselves on, and I and I just slipped in, and I slipped in because I focused on their values, service, providing a good culture, okay, by turning up and presenting myself with, with I guess you can say, some form of class, you know. Um, yep. I know we are plumbers, and it's easy to forget that at times because we are in some pretty tight underneath houses or in dirty trenches and all that, but you know, had a new outfit in the car for the next job, ready to go. And um, and that just basically snowballed from there, Matt, which then followed into suddenly you're doing work on properties and it involves, a, you know, an apartment above, which is then owned by another real estate agency. And, and now you, then you're involving yourself with another real estate agency that then they go, God, this guy's really onto it. God, he's proactive. 
he's taken a problem off our desk and he solved it. And um, and and let's be honest, that's 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 good service. If you can take a problem off someone's desk, and it's one less thing for them to deal with at the end of the day because they've got enough to deal with, they're going to ring you again. When you start creating more problems for other people, is when your business is starting to fail. Yeah, you definitely want to be solving them, not creating. Creating, the that's right. Yeah. Gloria Jean's co-founder, Peter Irvine, joined me for episode 18 and offered his thoughts on family, business, and how to make them both work together. You talk a lot about family, and one of the things you actually suggest a few times that I've heard you speak and indeed in your books is to involve your family in your business. Why do you give that advice? Well, very simply, I've seen it uh, um, both in my advertising agency days and the time when we started and ran Gloria Jeans with families, with franchisees, and even in the company itself, and with companies I've helped, that if if the relationship at home isn't going very well, it tends to be dragged into the business arena, and it affects how you relate to your staff, your customers, and it actually affects your business. If the business is struggling or they've got cash flow issues or clients deal with staff issues and you bring that home, it starts to affect the home life. So your whole life starts to to become well, terrible, I guess, and you don't, you think, do I really want to be doing this? Um, and you want to give up and close, go away, do something else. But the problem is you take the problem with you, you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I say to people, when you point the finger at someone, have a look and see the other three fingers are pointing back at you. Oh, there you go. And often it could be it could be us, and it might be an attitude we need to change. So I say, you know, if you go home and all you're doing is dumping onto the family the problems with the business, with the customers, with staff, and they never hear the good things, they start to resent the business, they start to resent where you work, they start to resent, resent the people you work for, and it's not always like that. It's just a perspective you've given them. It's interesting isn't it because some for some reason we do or have this ability to save the the worst parts for those that are closest to us right yeah correct what are your thoughts on do you have children yourself yes well they're both growing up one's 41 and the other's 39 have you thought about how you actually transfer what you've learned in a business sense onto them just sticking with this family theme for a minute well i mean these days um to say it less than what it would have been when they were growing up is probably true, but, you know, they still talk about what they're doing and sometimes you can bring a different perspective to something they may be confronting or an idea they can pursue with their business or different times working for an organisation and they've found that uh, helpful to have or I can introduce them to someone that can actually help them. Uh, with that particular issue but in their life and growing up (laughs) you know you've got to have got to develop a good relationship with your kids because in the end they often listen to other people rather than you that's yeah true true (laughs) and you can bring someone else into their life and they'll take every word as gospel (laughs) and they think oh old man what does he know um and you know and and that's understandable and you sort of accept that but that wasn't necessarily with, with my kids. Yes, they probably listen to other people, but, you know, when I imparted something or shared something or talked about something, I tried not to be a lecturer but just shared, you know, hey, uh, this happened or uh, this is the way I dealt with something like that. It might be helpful to you. And you never wonder, you never know whether it's going getting through or not, but it's interesting in later years you see them do something and you think, you know, they did take that in. <laughs> Because you can see it coming out. Did you ever actively involve them in the businesses that you're building? Like, as in, do they have a role in the business? Um, well, in the advertising agencies days, no, because they were in high school. But oh, of course, one yeah. of the things I thought I would do in those days is when school holidays came, a couple of times I actually took them into work with me for the day. Okay. And I just asked the different couple of different departments, like creative or media would you just uh, are you happy to spend have them spend a bit of time you know they can do work like filing whatever but share about your job and what you do 
And they had a great day. We went out and had lunch, you know, but they spent time with other people, got spoiled rotten. <laughs> but they had a great day and they learned from that. Um, in the Gloria Jean's days, um, they were getting a bit older, but still at school, I used to take them with me, particularly prior to Christmas, and we, we were delivering stock in my car every day to stores at Christmas because we're still trying to work out how much volume stock they needed in the business in the early years. But later on, our older son, uh, he started uni, didn't want to continue because he, I think he wanted to do uni for the wrong reason. And then he said, I don't really want to do this. So I got him a job uh, as a manager or assistant manager in one of the Gloria Jean stores, absolutely excelled and became passionate about coffee and training as a barista etc and over time the other guys in the company brought him into the business to operationally support stores then he became uh, training and drink development and eventually he and his wife started their own brand and concept up in Newcastle uh, after three years they sold that for a pretty good price because they built a great business so yes uh, he got involved uh, uh, other son he wasn't necessarily interested in working in the store. He was more in the technical video, technical area. But I got him an introduction to a company that willing to take him on and train him, you know, in that area. And he's excelled. He's in America now, based over there, working on major events like the US Open, the presidential election, the Tony Awards, etc., UN, and so on. So he's learning a phenomenal amount. Oh, uh, yeah, I bet he is in that, in that company. So in a way, yes, it, they were loosely, it, it, you bring them into the business. I, I say to people, be very careful bringing your son and daughter into the business immediately. Um, it's better they go and work somewhere else, under someone else, and then come and work in the business. If they come straight in, I've seen too many, and in a majority of cases, where the son or daughter has actually destroyed the business, because they haven't actually learnt the hard knocks, they haven't learnt to stand on their own two feet. They think it's a divine right to come in, and they make terrible decisions, and they treat people badly because they think, you know, they're the, you know, they really de facto own the business. Yeah, no, I, 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 hear, I hear what you're saying. It's a real balance, isn't it? I ask these questions because I've got very young kids myself, but I've already started thinking along these lines. And that is that you want to impart the best lessons and the wisdom that you have, I guess, but some of the time that comes out of the trials and tribulations that you go through. So how do you pass that on without that component, if you like, makes it very difficult to make it, it real? Does that make any sense? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Andre Bondarenko is a famous handstand expert and Cirque du Soleil performer. Here's a snippet from episode 19 on his diet, including when he eats and monitoring his weight. You mentioned sushi before. Do you follow a strict diet? I'm assuming to keep in the shape that you do, um, there'd be some sort of uh, diet that you'd need to adhere to? I'm trying to eat light and healthy food. I don't eat too much. I just used don't eat too much when, when I was in sport. And I was a flyer, so I was supposed to be a small and really light person. So I trying to eat soups every day it makes me feel better like at least broth like light soups not like cream soups so oh, yeah. broth and some protein i prefer chicken or fish i'm not vegetarian i i or at least beef mm, but beef sometimes i feel happy and also when i performing i don't eat before my performance, I eat after. So if I'm going to eat before, I feel like I'm heavy. And yeah, that's why I, I try to eat after my performance. I can eat, I can have just snacks or salad, some light food. So even if you're performing late in the day, you still won't eat or you'll eat very little, no main meals before you perform and just wait till you're done? Yeah, so for example, when it's normal day and I have one show per day or well, one show, if it's one show per day, so the show starts at 8. So I usually come about two or three hours before the show because we need to do our makeups and then warm up. And then we're going to say, so I come at 4 if I, it's one show per day. And I can eat some soup at around 
12 or 1 p.m. But if it's two shows per day, uh, and show starts usually at 4.30, so I have to be there at 1 or 1.30 p.m. So I try to eat some maybe oatmeal in the morning and some coffee, so around like maybe 8, p 8 a.m. And then I go in and I do the show, if it's two shows, so I do my first show and then I can eat some soup and then I have some break between the shows for maybe two hours. So it's enough time to to feel empty in my stomach again and then I do a second show and then in the evening I can have a like normal meal, good meal with the meat and maybe rice or mashed potato. So overall you eat, you eat very little then. Do you use any um, sort of uh, supplements with the amount of training and work that you're doing? I usually uh, take some protein shake when I'm doing uh, some training and I also take in vitamins in the morning. Is that just like multivitamins or something like that? Multivitamins and fish oil and some glucosamine for joints and then whey protein. I take maybe once a day per day. Sometimes I don't take whey protein. It depends if it's like I feel uh, sore in my muscles, I can take protein, but I, I'm not that person who's really strict with the diet. And I try to listen to my body. If I feel I need to eat burger today, <laughs> and so I'm fine with this. Do you monitor your weight really closely or it just, again, just goes on feel? So usually I'm trying to have same weight. It can be maybe like 700 grams difference, maybe one kilo, but if it's going to be one kilo, I'm going to get one kilo like in one day, I'm going to feel difference in my balance. So I try to keep my body weight same. Okay, and I guess that, uh, I mean, I know that you're not uh, doing the flying so much anymore, but if you get heavier, then you've got to let the people who've got to, you know, who are going to catch you know, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> get ready. There's uh, more weight coming in your direction. Uh -huh. Philip DeBella started DeBella Coffee with $5,000 and sold it for $47 million. Here's his thoughts on the tall poppy syndrome and a second grab on dealing with people, employee incentives, and developing culture. Why is it that we're so quick as Australians to take aim at our high achievers? I think because we've actually got a big um, disparity between um, people that are happy to, you know, I'd say there's three kinds of people in Australia. There's those that just want to bludge and do nothing and expect um, things to be done for them and government to hand out money. There's those that just want to go to work and, and do their thing and, you know, make an, in, an honest income and, and live life and, and have a, a good life. And then there's those high achievers. Um, that want to go out there and really make a mark for themselves and, and achieve, you know, high levels of, of whatever success it is. Um, and to me, the, the, the two later categories are great. We, you know, um, the, one, the only one that I begrudge is obviously category number one for those that just want to sit around and, and are happy for everyone else to pay their way for them. Um, and I think if you look at the tall poppy syndrome, um, it... You know, as a stereotype, what happens, it's it's those that aren't achieving what they wish they were in the three categories that will be begrudgingly having a go at those that are achieving what they are in those categories. Yep. So it's not really, to me, you know, the, the non-workers having a go at the successful high achievers or having a go at the successful everyday workers. It's more like the everyday worker in, the, um, in category two having a go at the same um, person in category two but that's achieving much better than them. Um, and in short, what I mean by that is that we, we, we have a, a way of facing outwards rather than inwards. And that's something that I find very common, you know, and I've had hundreds of staff now working with me across different businesses. And, and one of the key elements is that I always say to them, worry about yourself, worry about your personal brand, don't worry about what other people are doing. But as a nation, I think we, we constantly look outwards rather than looking inwards. Because it's easier, right, to look outwards rather than look in the mirror? Well, I don't know if it's easier. I don't know. I mean, this is, you know, obviously a question for the psychologists and would take a lot of work, but I don't know whether it's easier or whether it's a numbing effect, um, whether it's just, 
you know, I, I don't want to look at myself in the mirror, um, so it's easier to look external. I mean, again, I, I haven't put my finger on it, but um, I definitely know that, you know, the tall poppy syndrome exists because people aren't happy with where their position is in life. Um, and, and if they became happier with where they are and what they've achieved, because to me, success isn't about how much money you've got. It's not about what car you drive. It's not about the clothes you wear, jewellery. It's not possessions. Success to me is that harmonious lifestyle of being very comfortable with the person that you are. And if you're in that state, then you're very successful. And does it make it easier to deal with any criticism that may come your way? Because you've said before, if I've got it correct, that you have felt targeted from time to time. Oh, look, I, I, I have, but I'm not a victim. And the reason I'm not a victim is because I tell them to piss off. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm as direct as they come. I stab people in the chest. I don't stab them in the back. Um, you know, we've all got ego. We've all got emotions and, and a touch of ego. That's what drives us, right, at any level. But does it hurt? Well, well does it hurt as much as, um, you know, knowing that somebody's passing away? Well, no, of course not. So in the big scheme of things, if, if, you, if, you, if you look more internal and, make it, and look at what's relevant and what's not, you get over that pretty quickly. But I'm by no means a victim. I mean, you know, and, never, and, and don't play the victim because it's, you know, people are going to say what they want to say. And this is something for listeners to really think about. And I haven't been proven wrong yet, but 90% of the people that say bad things about you to others have never met you. Yeah. You know, and, um, and it's a common thing. If I have someone talking to me about somebody else, the first thing I say to them is, have you met that person? Do you actually know the person? And 90% of the time, nine out of every 10, have never met the person that they're actually happy rubbishing. So there's no question whether the tall poppy syndrome, um, you know, um, exists or not. But hey, if we're going to sit back and worry about that, we're never going to get anything done in our lives and we're not, never going to be happy souls. So, you know, screw that, get on with it um, and just work on looking inwards and being as happy as you can be. No, I couldn't, couldn't agree more. You really have to uh, take into account who is dishing out the advice and criticism from, from both angles. Oh, right? for sure. You know, learn how to build relationships. Um, learn how to emotionally engage with people. Learn how to work with people. Be authentic, you know, in how you deal with people. If there's a problem, tell them. Um, you know, let them tell you if there's a problem. Uh, you know, and it's just general, what I call basics, you know, is that yeah. everyone wants to feel valued, everyone wants to feel important. Um, and to create something like Debella took a lot of people. Yeah. And it took a lot of excellent people. And even the people that were difficult helped us become excellent because it taught us what not to do. Yeah. <laughs> it, it showed us what we didn't want in the business. So at all times, I mean, it's always about people. Did you ever have a challenge finding the right people? Oh, you always got a challenge finding the right people. Um, I, you know, the, the people are always going to be challenging. Um, I can be challenging. I am challenging. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a two-way street. It's not just other people that are challenging. And that's why I talk about the right fit. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's why I don't believe in resumes because people walk in with resumes and I've never seen an honest one. Everyone's conscientious, hardworking, honest and all this until public holiday comes across on a Tuesday and they take the Monday off. All of a sudden they're not that honest and authentic anymore. Um, you know, we've all got stories as employers that tell that. But, hey, when I say if you could see bad staff members, have a look at the manager or the owners because oh. ba bad people that don't suit your business should be kept in the business. Okay. So you got to move them on, I guess. With well, them. I've never fired a person in my life. I've just asked them to leave. Okay. Uh, I've told them it's better for them to decide to leave than what it is for me to fire them. Yep. It's not a good look having me fire them. Um, and I've had people give me three months' notice, six months' notice, nine months' notice. Um, it's all about keep spinning that Rubik's Cube. You've got to have aligned values with people. Their values have to align with you and your company values have to align with them. How much time did you spend reinforcing your values through that period? Every day. You never stop reinforcing your values. And you've got to live your values. You know, if I talk about being, um, a, you know, I want people to respond to my emails within 24 hours, then I've got to make sure I do the same thing. Um, if I say to people, I want you to communicate good, bad and ugly, then I've got to make sure I do the same thing. So I, as a leader, I'm very, I'm a very, in, I, I, I'm communicating constantly. I don't believe in closed doors. I don't believe in secrets. Um, I share figures with the team. I let them know what we're doing. I let them know what our vision is. I let them know what the, you know, the strategies. I let them have their input to strategy. Um, I have always had an innovations email where they can, you know, or an ideas email where they can express their ideas at any time. Um, you know, it's always been this constant dialogue and communication with the people. And that's when I say the word team, I mean from every facet. They've helped us. They hire their own staff. I've never hired the staff of the managers. The managers hire their own team. And oh, really? they need to hire them with their team so that the whole team is happy with who gets employed. Um, you know, just simple 
protocol, simple things like that, that really develop. And what you get at the other end is an amazing culture. You get a culture of engagement. You get a culture of efficiency. People love coming to work. They want to come to work. You know, we had our dispatch team, and I tell this story all the time, industry standard for distribution is 92 to 93 percent. of That's excellence. Whilst I was at the helm of this business as an owner and, and still post-ownership, but I was still the managing director until 30 June 2017, we were running at 98 percent and above default. De delivered in full on time. Yep. Now that is just outstanding for a company that's the biggest in what it does. Yep. The reward the team wanted, and they were asked, how do you want to be rewarded for excellence? So you went to them and asked them that Correct. question. Okay. And being a group of, you know, um, strong Samoan and Tongan boys and all the rest of it down there, they didn't want more money. They were getting paid good money in their eyes because they're all on full time. They're paid well above the award. They've all got families. What they wanted is they wanted a weekly barbecue on a Friday. Yep. Every time they hit that record, they, they did 98% or more. And it's a tradition that continues to today. So that if they hit a, a, a default, a delivered in full on time rate of 98% or higher this week, next week they have a barbecue paid for by the company. Now, their barbecues, let's just say, are not your typical barbecue, right? You can imagine the boys can eat. Yep. And they appreciate good quality. Yep. But in saying that, it just shows that it wasn't the money that was important, you know, and that they were comfortable with already what they're getting paid and they feel valued. But it was the camaraderie. It was the stopping work, getting together, cooking a barbecue. And what they do is they invite the rest of the team members. They don't just stay there in Insula. Everyone else at HQ gets an email saying, hey, barbecue is ready in half an hour if anyone wants to come down and join us. Oh, so that division is responsible for getting the barbecue across the line in terms of their results, yep. but they invite everybody else? They invite it. It's their choice because the barbecue is for them. Oh, okay, got it. But they obviously obviously do on a, mm. on a frequent basis. Correct. There seems to be a direct correlation between um, employee buy-in in terms of your business uh, and where you're going and the information that you're prepared to share with them. Yeah. The more you share, the more they buy in, which is what you sort of alluded to before. Mm. And you're saying that's exactly what happened. With yeah, and the key to that, and, I, and I'm happy to share it now, the key to that is share what's relevant. Okay. They don't want to know everything, yep. right? nor do I want to share everything or hide everything. And it's not that I don't want to share anything for any secrecy. Um, I don't want to be sitting down talking for 24 hours a day either. It's share what's relevant to the person. Yeah. You know, and, and what people have forgotten in business as this whole world of fast technology and, in, you know, and convenience is going out of control, our expectation gets out of control. And what I mean by that is we expect things quicker, we expect things better, we expect it cheaper. Our expectations are getting really out of control in this country, right? Okay. To the extent that somebody doesn't want to wait three, four minutes for a coffee anymore. Yeah. You know, I saw a lady get, get shitty the other day in a cafe because there was three people in front of her. And she literally waited no more than probably seven or eight minutes for her coffee and she still wasn't happy. Yeah. Now, it's technology that's driving that to us because you get used to what you get used to and you don't know what you don't know, right? So we're getting this whole speed up economy where everything's so quick and we want something, we just grab it, we can find it out by Googling it, we can order it to our door. You know, Amazon, when it comes, is going to be out of control because I've used it in America and it's an amazing business, but it's going to bring human behaviour issues with it. Yeah. Because we expect everything so quickly, yet we don't want to pay for the, what used to cost so much money. So this is a real danger of what's going on. Now, but the human behaviour hasn't changed. When somebody turns up to work and works for you, and you're the boss in their eyes and own the business, and they see that you're making money, they want to feel part of that. Yeah. Their expectation is that they want to feel part of it. And then they want to be appreciated. Now, they've, you know, I found that appreciation isn't money from the example that I told you before. Depreciation is knowledge. Yep. Is what is our vision? Win as a team, lose as a team. Yep. I found that in, you know, in 15 years of running Debella, you know, building it and running Debella, that what meant so much to people was the human element, not the capital element. And then they don't care whether you're driving a fancy car or you're, you know, you're owning a nice house or the rest of it. What they care about is that they feel part of your journey, that they feel part of that success and that you're acknowledging and rewarding them for that as well. Tom Crampton of Trusted Impact and I discussed cybercrime and how to protect yourself in episode 21. Here's a snippet. Now, me as a regular, everyday, average person going about my business, standard day-to-day -day stuff, Am I really at risk of or under threat 
of uh, being becoming a victim of cybercrime? Yeah, look, Matt, um, in these days when everybody's going digital, uh, the internet is important to them. They transact their business. Even small organizations are transacting their business on the internet. Oftentimes they have apps or various other tools and, and things to be able to help them do what they do on an everyday basis. And unfortunately, when you're connected electronically, that means a lot of people have access to the, the electronic digital kinds of assets that you have. So what do I mean by that? Uh, there's 3.8 billion people on the internet, which is great because you have a big audience to sell to, to talk to, to communicate with. But if one out of a hundred, just one person out of a hundred wanted to do something malicious or typically not personal, they just want to make money off of your data, that's bigger than the entire population of Australia alone. So... Those, it's easy to forget or not think about those numbers. You know, 3.8 billion, okay, it's a big number. But if you really think about it, one out of 100 is still a really big number. So for someone like me personally, what, have I, what are they targeting? What can they, what can they take from me? What's valuable? There's uh, unfortunately a lot of creativity when it comes to the, the criminals. Um, there on one end is the very sophisticated and it's easy to talk about really cool, neat, kind of trendy kinds of things called nation state threats of where the good guys and the bad guys are constantly trying to infiltrate each other. That would be, for example, the US, the UK, Israel, Australia on the good side, I'd like to believe. Yeah. Uh, and adversaries on the other side. North Korea's recently been recognized as having, strangely enough, an organ here's a country that doesn't have much internet, uh, but is uh, considered to be growing considerably in their cyber threat, threat capability. And but recently you've got the US and Russia with their election, which is a big yeah, cyber discussion. Yeah, absolutely. So that's on one end of the scale. And, and, you know, frankly, at the end of the day, anybody can get anything with enough time, money, and motivation. So that's kind of off of the scale. They typically, a, a nation doesn't care about us. They don't particularly care about you. Um, as an individual. You're as an about. individual, correct. Or as a small business, typically. Yeah. Uh, and yet, on the other end of the scale is a lot of just um, low-skilled people trying to monetize your data, trying to somehow be able to either um, take the information that you have that they can try to monetize, get money out of, or do things like lock up your computer and hold it for ransom for $300, $500 so that they can go after the masses and, and get lots of money that way. So at that really basic level, $300, $500 ransom, that actually happens? Well, you wouldn't believe how prevalent that is. Oh, I'm, I'm, I haven't heard of it on that uh, lower level, if that's the right way of putting yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. In the last six months, uh, three in particular, there have been these um, three real waves that went across the world of this ransomware, so software that is malicious stuff yes. that if and when downloaded will encrypt your hard drive and hold it for ransom until you pay in Bitcoin, of all things. Former Commonwealth Games athlete and national high jump champion Jane Nisbet joined me over Skype from London for episode 22. Here's a section from our chat on her battle with eating disorders, the subject of her book, Freed. It's quite like a, a harsh sport. And then I think a lot of people in terms of like coaches as well, sometimes don't realize the stuff that they would say. And um, it became quite, a, I think especially females just overanalyze a lot of stuff. And you're totally um, on show. So obviously when you're competing, you're in crop top, you're in pants, like people, you're out there on the field for people to judge you. And um, I just became more and more aware of it, more and more aware of other people, thought I needed to be lighter to jump higher. And then it just literally spiraled out of control that I completely lost perception of what my goals were. It became so obsessed with like looking a specific way I wasn't so bothered about the performance. And then that's when my head just went. It was like, I was just tiny. Like I dropped to 47 kilos. And um, I mean, I'm five foot eight and a half. So I think my BMI was down at like 14.7. 
and that that's ridiculously low. And I never at the time never seen the issue with it. Obviously, my performance had gone downhill, and it wasn't until I started to just when you when you have like mental health issues, you convince yourself that it's okay, but it's not, and you're really really unhappy. And at that point. I was getting told I had to eat. People were like, if you don't eat, I'm going to force food in you. I was petrified of talking to people about it. Um, People just looked at you differently. And then I would start hiding like when I would eat because I didn't want people to see me eating because I felt like they'd be judging me and judging like what I ate. And it just sort of spiraled out of control from there that I just literally went into social recluse for about 10 months. I didn't, I could barely like leave my bed. I would only leave the house at abnormal hours so people couldn't see like what I was up to, what I was eating, what training I was doing. And um, that probably went on for yeah, about eight to ten months. From that point, I hit a point one night that basically I just didn't want to be here anymore. And um, I remember I'd had – the doctors had put me on Prozac basically to try and calm down your thoughts because when you say that you've got – um, an eating disorder they think if they give you antidepressants it's going to help rationalize your brain but unfortunately for me it had the absolute adverse effect so I was so like not myself because I'm like a really I am like a really upbeat bubbly person so it suppressed my personality even more so I just was like completely not myself didn't want to be here so I literally um text like text my mom I was just like I can't do this anymore I switched my phone off and just I disappeared I talk about it in the book I just disappeared out into the woods um for hours just hoping something would happen to me or I would just freeze or anything and then it was just like a light for some reason that night like it was like one of these nights it was crystal clear evening and I had so many thoughts going through my head and I was like Jane like you cannot let this beat you like why are you letting this beat you this is ridiculous like this isn't you and then I made I got back and I was like probably about four hours later and I made this decision I was like I cannot let this beat me like this I'm worth so much more than this. Like, and that's when I was like, I need to sit down and analyze exactly what is going on now and how I'm going to do it. And it, I mean, it wasn't easy. I had like, I would say that like you get two days and then you'd have a bad day and then another two days and have a bad day. But then each time it was like, maybe like four days before I had a bad day and then five days before I had a bad day. And it took a bit of time to realize that actually that was progress because every time you had a bad day, you'd beat yourself up about it. And you can maybe have a bad day for a few days because you'd like got three days down and you're like, oh, I've ruined it now. So um, it was quite a long process back to being healthy. Author Roland Lazenby joined me for episodes 23 and 24 of the podcast to discuss two of his books, Michael Jordan, The Life, and Showboat, The Life of Kobe Bryant. Here's a grab from each episode. All the efforts in in working with these guys was to try to help them find a sense of compassion as a human. But in the competitive format, they didn't have compassion for their teammates, opponents. They were just ruthless in, uh, in pursuit of male dominance. It was just a very raw, basic thing. And they they had the physical ability. They had the intelligence and and all of those qualities that made them very dominant figures. And the compassion part first was to help them relate to less talented teammates. And later became a function as a life skill to help them adjust to leaving the game because they had a switch that could not be turned off. And I think we saw this weekend, uh, an all-star weekend, a little bit of Kobe Bryant. He, He has a tremendous regard for George Mumford, as does Michael Jordan. They just prize the man. And um, I think Kobe Bryant flipped the switch off a good bit this weekend. He's had to. He's had an ugly, ugly season. 
it's been nice with the gifts at various NBA cities that he's received and the, the accolades. But let's be honest, his play is, is terrible. The Lakers are terrible. It's a harsh, far harsher than anything that Jordan faced as an older player. But but Kobe never really has had his athleticism since he tore the Achilles tendon. But anyway, um, learning this compassion obviously was critical to them, to encouraging them to play team basketball. And it, it, it really has become critical to them later. I wanted to ask whether they actually use their lesser teammates in a sense to drive themselves further. And I got the feeling on a few occasions with Michael that if things got, in the terms of a game, bad enough, then he was going to flip that switch and and say, you know what, you guys aren't good enough, I'm going to get it done myself, and use that to actually drive more out of themselves. That's true of both of them, yes. And, uh, you you know, um, both of them would use whatever device available to sort of push themselves to heighten states wherever they could find them and do it. Kobe Bryant, for the most part, like any kid, any sane kid in that era, wanted to go to college. But his family, one of the things that was not known is how badly his family, Kobe's family, needed money. And so their big plan was to have him turn pro. And, of course, Adidas and Sonny Vaccaro paid him millions to turn professional. It it was really the first case of a shoe company coming in and offering a whopping amount of money to a high school kid to become a pro. Kobe was, it's a fascinating part of the book, Kobe was a, was basically a, a pawn at that time of his life, moving between uh, his dad's, um, I suppose, vision for him, their money issues, and then the part that he played for the shoe companies. He was. Did you ever get the sense that he didn't want to be forced into that position? I mean, I know he said that he, he did want to go to college, if I remember correctly. Right. You know, I think some of the amazing things are that Kobe was dramatically manipulated by the shoe company and by his parents. And he bore that in silence. He became incredibly angry at both the shoe company and his parents. And when he was a pro in Los Angeles, right in the midst of some of his biggest games, winning championships in the playoffs, he threw his family out of his life, and he also threw Adidas, the shoe company, out of his life, basically. Paid lots of money to get rid of Adidas, and just totally, and no one knew this. He did the whole thing in silence. This went on for years. There would be some small uh, Twitters, whispers about it. I don't want to say Twitters. People get that confused. But there would be some talk about not much. He really kept the whole thing to himself. Even the guy who was advising him psychologically, George Mumford, uh, did not know these things. And it, it really is astounding, the family story in which you know, Kobe just reacted to everything in his life. And the, the, reaction, the reaction was to kick everybody out, right? <laughs> yes, and become his own man. Uh, you know, he, he married. Uh, his parents were not pleased with his fiance. Logan Nathan joined me for episode 29 to discuss technology in trade businesses and the app he has developed called i4 Tradies. In the future, the trade business owners, unless they are customer focused, they're going to be difficult to exist, purely because of the technology now allows people to communicate back straight to the community before even they know it. That's why every business owners, particularly trade business owners, got to be switched on for being customer focused and listen to customer feedback. That's what this is all about. So it's an opportunity for them to correct and change the way they do business. Yeah, I think we've 
as tradesmen, as a trade industry, we're yet to be forced through that fundamental shift, if you like. You know, Airbnbs has done it to hotels. Uber's done it to the taxi industry. We really haven't had to go to this level yet, but it's getting closer and closer, whatever your opinion is, because as more of these companies get across the line in terms of that conversion to yep. an app-based and ratings-based and this way of doing things, customers get used to it. Correct. And they get conditioned, right? Correct. So if you're brought up, I mean, if you're under, what, 25 or something now? No, 35. 35? Yeah, you're going to be very... Um, Technology savvy. For sure. So you're going to expect that. So that's just going to become a prerequisite of just being in business, right? You're going to have to do it that way. You're going Correct. to have to lift the level of your game to be up to what the customers just expect, whether that's right or wrong, just like when Amazon starts in Australia. Well, it's going to shake up a lot of retailers. Because if you, don't, yeah, if you don't deliver in a couple of hours, people will get used to that. If you don't, it just highlights that, that area of your business, right? Correct. And it's going to be harder to get and keep customers if you don't keep up to that what will become a minimum standard. I'm sure of that, if nothing else. Uh, exactly, exactly. So it is um, consumer that's going to really demand the way they expect the service to be delivered. And that's what the whole thing is all about. So iPhone trade is it's really, really giving them an opportunity for the trade business to change their behavior, change the way the business process works, and be part of that process. Yep. And I can tell you, just three years ago, this was not possible. The technology, the technology wasn't, wasn't Yeah, wasn't really matured enough to do this. Okay. It's only in the last couple of years, three years, that really matured enough for us to develop such a system and bring it to market. I was actually thinking about this over the past weekend because I'm one of probably thousands of traders out there who spent... I did a rough calculation in my head. I think that we've probably spent in excess of six figures trying to implement in the past a job management system similar to what this at this stage appears to be and it hasn't worked and we had to go back to our old ways of doing things. What do you say to those companies who hear about this and think, as I initially did, it wasn't until someone tapped me on the shoulder and said you should take a closer look at this, that I did, what do you say to those companies that are, here we go again? Well, I can just say, just listen to what happened to Uber. The taxi drivers paid 300, 400, 500,000 for a number plate and how that value dropped overnight. If you are not prepared to disrupt the way your business is working, and if you really think that, you know, my system works, and but it's not customer focused, think again. And in terms of cost, there is not really any more cost there. It's, it's today's technology is all about pay as you benefit, right? So coming back to i4 traders, it costs nothing for the consumer to use it, it costs the employers or the trade business owners as they benefit out of the system. So we are taking the pain out of way, all the capital, everything that you're talking about, and distributing it and benefiting from the transaction based rather than, you know, let me build a customer solution, right? The, today's the customer solution is all about what the customer wants, what not the company wants. When they want it? When and they how want, they want it. How they want it. Yes. And therefore, the other thing challenge for those technologies that you're talking about that existed only about four or five years ago, mm -hmm. the technology is changing so fast, you can't keep up with it. So if anybody is paying internally, they are really draining their money, wasting their money unnecessarily because it doesn't matter what they do, it's going to be outdated within two to three years. What we are promising to our clients, we let you do your work, you focus on your work, let us know what the technology that you want. We will take the journey with you. In a really on the ground, day to day business sense, you're encouraging business owners to outsource the technology component of their business. Correct. So, this is basically a platform for them to run the business where they want to run it. So, the system itself is flexible enough to configure the way they want to run the business. All be it, got to be custom focused. That's the underlying changes that they need to make. Renee Kylie transformed herself from an obese business owner at 104 kilos to a professional triathlete in just three and a half years. Here's a section of our chat from episode 30. After you started to exercise and you started to go onto this journey of becoming a now professional triathlete, is it hard getting started from that huge weight? So hard. So hard. To when it starts clicking? Yeah, it was... Um 
that first, gosh, that first 12 months um, was so emotional and so hard. And that's, I hope, you know, that's why I want to share more of my story next year, not about being a tri professional triathlete, more about that journey, that weight loss journey and getting started because that's what I'm really all about and that's where a lot of the emotion was. Like I, I remember, you know, people look at me now and I think they forget that I went on that. They just see me as I am now and see my results as I am now, but they forget that only three and a half years ago it was 105 kilos, you know, like I... What weight are you at now? Around about 61 kilos when I'm racing. So you've lost 40%. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, about 40% of my body weight. Yeah. And I th as I said, people forget that and they just see as you are now and think that this has all happened or oh, I've always been like this. But, you know, when I first started, I was 105 kilos. I couldn't run. Like I was, you know, I'd go, I wouldn't run outside. I'd only run on a treadmill because I didn't want people to see me outside because I looked terrible I couldn't get clothes to fit me I couldn't use cycling kits and stuff you would know doing a bit of cycling in your time cycling clothes I swear are like two sizes smaller than normal clothes they're not forgiving at all yeah they're not <laughs> forgiving so I couldn't get stuff to fit me I, I remember joining a triathlon club after a couple of months of just doing some exercise on my own because I was too embarrassed to join a club before that because I didn't want everyone to look at me because I was so big and I couldn't do anything. But I remember sitting in my car before some of the sessions, like crying, like wanting to go, breaking out literally in an anxious sweat and in tears to myself because I just was so nervous and anxious about going to do a group run or a group ride because I didn't want everyone to or it is really difficult for the first three to six months there was lots of times like that but I think some people say oh it's you know once you do it for a couple of weeks you're fine and it becomes easy that's not true you have to do it for three months I think when you're in the state that I was you have to commit and be prepared to deal with that hard times and difficult times for probably three months before it becomes easy. And was that the mark about three months in when you thought, okay, I'm getting somewhere here? Yeah. You know, when you're 105 kilos, a kilo, two kilos, five kilos, it's not much really yeah. in the scheme of things. But I think it was, my, I started the journey pretty much January 1, say, in 2014. And in March 2014, I did my first sprint try and I remember I was 80 kilos. Okay. So, so that's, a, that's pretty quick. That's like, a, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And it, when the, the good thing is when you are obese and bigger, the weight does come off really quickly in those early times. And this is why I think a lot of people stop is that they say they're 105 kilos, they commit for two or three weeks, they only see three or four kilos and that doesn't look much when you're on you're 105 kilos and then they give up and they stop. But look what happened. You commit for three months and you lose 20 kilos and all of a sudden you've changed clothes sizes by five, six sizes and it's a very dramatic change. And from then on, that's when it becomes easy because you see what's possible. Thank you to you all for supporting Trench Talk and I really look forward to bringing you a whole lot more over the coming year. Just a couple of things before you guys clock off. You can get all Trench Talk episodes at xrm.com.au forward slash podcast. You can also sign up for other goodies at the same site. Just plug your email in there and you are covered. That's x for x-ray, r for romeo, m for mike.com.au forward slash podcast. If you really like what I'm bringing you, please head to iTunes, subscribe to this show and leave a review right there. And lastly, if you want to contact me directly, type the at symbol followed by Mr. Matt Reynolds into your search bar and you'll find all the social links. Goodbye.